24, 2017. My name is John Michael. I work with the Codes Department, and I'll be making the presentation of the cases today for the Board's consideration. Um, out of deference, we would ask at the beginning of the meeting if everyone would please mind turning off your smartphones or at least silencing them, iPods or whatever else, iPads rather, just lest that it interrupt any of the Board's proceedings. Thanks in advance for that help. For each of today's public hearings, the Board reviews the correspondence that's been submitted in support of and opposition to each of the cases. Additionally, the Board reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. And in each of today's hearings, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other pertinent data relative uh, to the case that thus comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff's presentation, the appellant will have the opportunity to present his or her case to the Board. After the appellant's presentation, the Board would hear from any of those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. After those parties have spoken, the board would then hear from those parties wishing to present testimony in opposition to the appeal. In the event that there is a contested case with opposing testimony, the appellant will have the opportunity to present rebuttal testimony to conclude the, the public hearing. Under BZA rules, an appellant has 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board if there is no opposition present. For contested cases, each side is allotted 15 minutes to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to use rebuttal testimony time, it's imperative that you set aside some portion of that time out of the originally allotted 15 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on each case. The board is vested with the power to act on those cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17.40.180. All the section numbers that we refer to today come from the Metropolitan Code of Laws, uh, almost exclusively from Chapter 17, which is the Zoning Code, and that applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective in its current form on January the 1st of 98. And I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The Metropolitan Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for uh, public television, it is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board come forward, take a seat here at the front of the room, use the microphone to introduce yourself by name and address, and then make the desired presentation to the board. The Metro Code also requires four of our seven board members in order to establish quorum. The code requires at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that only four members are present and the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the appeal will be advertised for the next available public hearing. In the event that five or more members are present and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party has the opportunity uh, to appeal cases to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party may file, under certain circumstances, a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date, pursuant to the terms of the Board of Zoning Appeals rules and regulations. After that time elapses, a case de decision becomes final, and no further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, then you are actually required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A board's approval only stays valid for two years. After that time, an appellant will be required to come back to the board and seek the variance or other approval that's been secured here today. It should also be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, then any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the same Board of Zoning Appeals. Mr. Chairman, I'd submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order. All appellants have been notified by certified mail and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled in preparation for each of today's cases. We have no preliminary amount announcements at this time. However, with the uh, Chairman's consent, we would take this opportunity to recognize any elected officials who are with us today for the proceedings. And unless I'm missing anyone there, Oh, right in the very front row. Yes. Councilman Birch, pleasure to see you. you. Looked in the back of the room, not the front. Councilmember Birch, would you like to address the board here at the outset of the meeting? Very well. We'll take, the, take a seat while Councilmember Birch addresses Council the board. Councilman Birch, welcome to the BZA. Good to see you here. Please press, press the little button. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I'm speaking on case 
um, 2017-105. This is um, where um, uh, a request for variance for a, a detached accessory garage. Um, I'm asking for, for this to be deferred to meetings. Um, I was just notified by the council office that this was on the agenda today. So I was trying to, to get some research as it relates to this property and I wanna actually get some, some information from, from stormwater due to this is an area um, where there's some stormwater um, concerns over in the Apollo area. Also, um, I would like to get with the homeowner. I don't know if this came about because this structure already exists and they're asking for the approval on, on the back end. Um, I don't know if this um, was as a result of uh, my district. I requested um, multiple uh, street audits from the, from the codes department and I don't know if this property um, is as a result of that. I haven't been able to get a return call back from codes. So I would like a two meeting deferral so I can get my information from Stormwater and get more of a thorough history from the codes department too as it relates to, to this variance. And I know that's, that's really outside your purview, but um, I believe that they're here as a result of, of actions from the codes department. Sure. Um, normally when the council person requests a uh, deferral, we're very amiable to um, listen to that request. John Michael, can you give us any more information about this or? Not pursuant to an audit. Uh, it's a pre-existing structure. And if the appellant is present, it may be agreed upon to defer to a later date. Uh, the appellant is Jose Lopez. Is Mr. Lopez present? Yes, sir. Mr. Lopez, if you would step forward to the microphone, please. And could you press the button and identify your name and address for the record? Yeah, uh, my name is Jose Lopez. Okay, your address? It's at 124 Apollo Court is in uh, Enyaq, Tennessee. Okay, you know why you're here today. Um, it sounds like there was a detached garage built um, prior to a permit getting um, issued. Mm -hmm. the, your council person, who's your elected official for that area of town, is requesting a deferral because she wants more information on how this happened and kind of what your request is. So normally when a council person says she, he or she needs more time, we are going to push this back to a meeting probably a month from now. Is that what you asked for? Beyond the budget, just, yeah. Beyond the budget. So John Michael, what are we talking about? That all important Metro Council budget? July. Oh. That would be a two month deferral, Mr. Chairman. Typically we don't defer more than two meetings, which would be four weeks in this instance. Right. Okay. We can make it work. Okay. So what was our, what would be our two, our month deferral or two meeting deferral? Looks like that'll put us out to June the 1st. June the 1st? Okay. That'll work. Okay. So um, discussion from the board about this request. Okay, do you have, so what we are, what, your council person wants is a deferral so it won't be heard today and actually it won't be heard until June 1st. It should be, should be fine though. Okay. So in the interim, I don't know if there, John Michael, is there any boilerplate things that you need to say about? I'll just solicit a board, action? I'll just solicit a board vote for the deferral and the case will be brought back on June the 1st. Is this structure finished or are they still building some things? I guess is what I'm asking. If there's other construction, I'm not aware of it, but this is a quite finished structure presently. Okay. Okay. So, um, do I hear a motion to defer this to the June 1st meeting? Move we defer to June 1. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. This case will be heard June 1st. Thank so you, Chair and Commissioners. You'll be back Thank here you. June 1st to talk about this case. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, we'll move forward toward the consent agenda. As the BZA utilizes a consent agenda, it involves the review by one board member of each of the cases in the record prior to today's hearings. That board member identifies cases where the appellants have met the, the criteria for the requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that case testimony would not alter the material facts, then that case is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended for today's hearing. And if anyone's, anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases we identified for the consent agenda, please just raise your hand so that we can notice you and then make sure that the case is removed from the consent agenda and just heard in its regular order today. 
Mr. Chairman, the first case recommended for the consent agenda is case 2017-100 involving the property at 4816 Charlotte Avenue and a requested variance for a sign panel change. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 100? I see none. The second case on the proposed consent agenda is case 2017-102 involving the property at 511 Cave Road requesting variances from lot size and fence requirements for utilization of a recycling facility. Is there anyone here in opposition, on opposition to case number 102? Seeing none, the third case so recommended is 2017-103 involving property at 4008 Copeland Drive and a request for a variance from front setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 103? Seeing none, the next case recommended for the consent agenda is 2017-104 involving the property at 1335 Plum Street as a church's request for a special exception in order to utilize a multi-purpose building on the church property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 104? Seeing none, the next case identified for the consent agenda is 2017-109, involving the property at 4204 Belmont Boulevard. This request for a variance from front setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 109? Seeing none, the next case identified for the consent agenda is 2017-111, involving the property at 1300 Stainback Avenue, requesting a change in legally nonconforming use in the RS5 zoning district. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 111? Seeing none, the final case identified for the consent agenda is case 2017-115, involving the property at 4514 Shies Hill Road, and a request for a variance from front setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 115? I came here to find out more information about I'd be glad to speak with you at the break, ma'am. That might give you more information and we'll determine whether this should be on the consent or not. John Michael, can you ask our Com Vanderbilt Commodore fan who just came in the meeting late which case he's here for? Sir, which case are you here on? Not recommended for consent. Okay. With that, Mr. Chairman, we'll remove 115 until we can have an opportunity to speak with the interested party. And I would recommend cases 100, 102, 103, 104, 109, and 111 for the current consent agenda and solicit a board vote. Okay. That is the consent agenda. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Um, it's been properly moved to uh, approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. For those who have just had their cases approved on consent agenda, you're done here today. You'll be able to come and pursue your permit as early as tomorrow. If there's any confusion because it's not in the computerized system yet, give us a little patience as we try to get it up and ready for you. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to go. Um, as to case number 115, once we present the first case, I'll take a moment to speak with the interested party after that first case mm -hmm. so that we can determine whether or not that one too can proceed on consent, sure. Mr. Chairman. Absent any other board business here at the outset, we'll proceed with the first hearing. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mr. Chairman. The first case to be presented to the board today is number 2017-084, involving the property at 804 Montrose Avenue here in Nashville. The zoning map here shows the property <coughs> relative to the rest of the residential properties around them, most of which are zoned R8. The aerial shows the property in its demolished state before the new construction was completed in a fast evolving area just below 12 South. From my recent site visit to the subject property, this is uh, the upper left-hand corner, a view from the street, and is standing at street level with the elevated wall um, and the fence on top of that. The lower right-hand corner showing a slightly more southwestward view up toward the subject wall and fence. Finally, the view up and down Montrose, just for the perspective of the slope of the street. 
Finally, more from the street again, a view of the house, the wall, and the fence that's in question here. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 84? Seeing no one, the appellant will have the opportunity to make the desired presentation to the board. The appellant is Taylor Lohan, I believe, on behalf of the property owner. Mr. Lohan, are you present? Mr. Chairman, is anyone else here on behalf of case number 84? Mr. Chairman, seeing no one responsive to case number 84, this being its second setting on the docket, um, the board has options as to whether to defer the case one meeting to our next date, which I believe is May the 18th, or in the alternative, take up action to deny the appeal since no one's here to make the appeal and afford them the opportunity to refile a new case if they wish. You say this is the second time? No, it is. It's, it's at least the third time. At least the second is what I would say and possibly okay. the third. Mr. Taylor, do you have a motion or do you have anything to add about this? I mean, normally, okay, in this modern world of traffic, rain, you know, but we have ways to contact our codes department and this is noticed it's online, this is the agenda, everybody else has come here. Um, what is the board's kind of preference about this? Well, I tend to say it's the second time set. Uh, we've given them two opportunities to be here. Mm -hmm. There is one letter in opposition, and I think they should have to go back through the process if they want to pursue the appeal. Okay. okay. Um, is that a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll move that the appeal is denied based on their not being here. Okay. Nice second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Mr. Chairman, the next case slated to be heard is case 2017-085. This is a case that previously was heard by the board two meetings ago at 1004 Waverly Avenue. It was an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit based upon prior operation before obtaining the legally required permit. Uh, the appellant is Carla Stevenson. Ms. Stevenson, are you present? Is anyone else here representing Ms. Steven? With that, Mr. Chairman, I would note that in this instance, this matter was taken to the environmental court and was heard, I believe, as recently by the court as yesterday. Is that right, Mr. Osborne? Yes, sir. So just heard yesterday at the court, the uh, defendant in that case accepted the court's ruling that a three-year wait would be required before the next application for a short-term rental prop uh, STRP permit at this location, which probably obviates any action the board would take anyway. Three years, that end, wow. We anticipated that the uh, appellant might contact us to withdraw this case. Mm -hmm. Um, however, absent that, it's probably appropriate for the board to take some sort so of formal action So remind those today. who are sitting at home watching or si watching online or here, why would someone get three years for, uh, you know, not being able to apply for this particular piece of property? Because I couldn't persuade counsel to make it five. <laughs> nice. Okay. So, but seriously, what did they do? I want to hear from our lawyer. What did, what did they do? The uh, Metro Code states that if a court of competent jurisdictions, jurisdiction finds that someone is operating a short-term rental property without a permit, that the court shall impose a three-year injunction. So the court, unlike this board that has some discretion of up to a year, the court does not have any discretion. So upon the finding of guilt, there is a mandatory three-year injunction. Okay, short-term rentals have been in the news in front of council this week. Uh, here is an example, item A, if you will, in more than one way, that someone operated a short-term rental without the proper permit. The city found out about it, investigated them, took them to court, and a court ruled, not us, that they can't operate a short-term rental on this site for three years. Okay? Is that, that is correct? correct? That is correct. Okay, so. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that based on the, the finding of the environmental court, uh, the zoning administrator did not err in uh, denying this short-term uh, permit, and therefore we will side with the zoning administrator on this case. Uh, since the penalty from the environmental court is greater than anything we would do, I don't have a penalty involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's been made. Properly second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Mr. Michael. Chairman, with a relatively robust consent agenda, that brings us all the way up to 2017-106. This is a case involving the property on Nolensville Pike. 
Um, the appeal from the, prop from the owner of the property, William Crossman, is two-part. Uh, first, an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a permit in the IR, that's Industrial Restrictive Zoning District, based upon a determination of the change in use of the subject property. And although Mr. Dean is here to represent the appellant, and I'm quick to let him explain his own case, it's my understanding that the alternative version of the appeal, in the event that the item A case does not... Um, is not successful at the board, is for um, a variance from the conditions of use for the proposed use, which is a grocery at the subject property on Nolensville Road. The aerial view here shows you the property in pretty close to its current condition. Um, if I may, just above the red marker is actually the subject property. From my recent site visit showing the face of the property here in the appropriately posted zoning appeal hearing sign and the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, and the view up and down Nolensville Road. This, of course, is a bustling area, busy with commerce, some residential uses, and a long history of commercial development up and down um, Nolensville Road. As for this case, Mr. Dean will make the appeal on behalf of his client. Mr. Dean. Good afternoon, um, George Dean for the appellant, Mr. Uh, Crossman. Uh, Mr. Crossman owns the property uh, on Nolansville Road. It's zoned industrial restricted. It's not zoned commercial, and there's the little problem with the case. The original case was filed actually by his tenant. Uh, what's, what's her name again? Uh, uh, Rose, who's going to um, uh, operate this uh, small grocery. Uh, when they went in for the application, um, there is a provision in the zoning ordinance that was adopted in 1998. This became effective in 1998 that said in an IR zoned district, you can't have more than 2,500 square feet as retail. Um, the, they didn't know what to do at that point. They, they asked for a variance, and that's why there's a variance in the application. Yeah. We're really not relying on that. Mr. Dean, give us and people at home a kind of short history of what is the IR district and why would that law be in place? Uh, well, the industrial zoning, uh, industrial restricted zoning district basically is kind of the next to the most intense uh, zoning district in the city. It's industrially uh, uh, zoned uh, and you can use it for almost anything with the exception of perhaps the most uh, intense uses in the city. Uh, rock quarries, for example, are not permitted, uh, but all kinds of other uh, heavy commercial and industrial uses are actually permitted in the IR zoning district. Um, the intent was really, if you're gonna have all these uses to have it a smaller footprint. I'm, I'm not sure why the, the, if you're asking about the 1998 amendment restricting it to 2,500 square feet, I'm not sure exactly why that was put in there. I, 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 I don't have a, a, a real bead on that because one would think that um, uh, fairly uh, not very intense commercial uses would probably fit uh, in an industrial area. Usually in Euclidean zoning, you know, um, they uh, allow uh, the same, the uses that were uh, permitted in the above, next above zoning district are allowed in the next below districts and it just builds one on another. That's why they call it Euclidean zoning. Yeah. But this um, is just a grocery store. This is just a grocery store. It's a very small site. I'm sorry to get wander off on that. Uh, 5,000 square feet. The real thrust of the application here is that the, not, not a variance, but, but um, uh, seeking for the board to recognize it as legally non-conforming. Uh, the, um, because of the way it got filed, I didn't have a chance really to talk to Bill Herbert about this until just a few days ago, and we didn't have, he didn't have a chance to take a look at it carefully uh, at that time. Um, the, prior to 1998, when this provision was adopted, the 5,000, the 2,500 square foot uh, zoning restriction was adopted, this property got a building permit for retail uses uh, it just for, for the size of that building, just less than uh, 5,000 square feet, basically. Um, they've been using it for that same purpose, not the same uh, 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 tenant, but it's been used for that same general idea, more than 2,500 square feet since 1997. So essentially what I'm saying is it's legally non-conforming, uh, both under the Metro Zoning Ordinance, the non-conforming provisions in the METSO, as well as uh, the Tennessee State statute 13-7-208, uh, 
this is protected land use because it was there prior to the enactment of the uh, restriction on the commercial, the retail use in the IR zoning district. Did so, I get any of that across? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I made it more okay, complicated so Mr. It needs Dean, to be. We're, well, this is a, as you know, this is an item A appeal. Yes, sir. We're going to ask our zoning administrator why he's right, but I want to ask you why he's wrong. I, I, I don't know that that Bill actually had a chance to look at it at the time the decision was made, and my clients, when they filed the application, didn't know about non-conforming uses, essentially. Uh, and so when I, when I got the first phone call from Mr. Crossman, he was talking in terms of, can you go down and properly file a variance? And I said, well, it sounds to me like we don't need a variance. It sounds like a non-conforming use, and that's where this came from. And I defer to Bill. George, you don't mind, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Um, thanks for acknowledging I haven't had a chance to look at it, and that's true enough. Right. <laughs> um, so what was the use before? The, the one that was, uh, uh, the, the 97 was a uh, beauty products retail outlet. Uh, okay. uh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Um, uh, and Mr. Crossman says, tells me that um, in reviewing the uses of the property since that time, they've, it's been all uh, retail use out there. Okay. So, uh, based upon what Mr. Dean's telling me, <clears throat> if the, the the proposed use is going to is going to a grocery store, is that correct? That's correct. So, in my mind, a a retail establishment and a grocery store. A grocery store is really, it, even though it's a separate land use that's categorized in the land use table, it is really a lot like retail. I mean, it really is. Um, so, from my perspective. I don't have any objection to this at all. I see this as much about the uh, the square footage and the nonconformity that you know the, it's the nonconforming use aspect of mm -hmm. it. Um, so I would ask the board um, to to go forward. No, I don't have any objection um, to. Um, the use itself. I think it's a grocery store is a form of retail, mm -hmm. so uh, okay. I have no objection to that. And if the board grants the square footage, I don't have any objection to that either. I think it's it's better before the board for this to, to render a um, a decision on, on that issue. I think it's properly before you. Okay. But but know that I don't have an objection to this based upon what I've heard. Okay. So what we we will have to vote later whether uh, yes, the zoning administrator is right or wrong. But there's this variance that. Mr. Herbert said of 5,000. So talk to us about the variance. Uh, really, the, the variance is unnecessary. Uh, because oh. essentially what, what I'm saying is it's been, it's, it's been used either for that. Either or. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if so we overturn Bill, that's good enough for you. That, that, that's right. Okay. Uh, so um, board members, do you have any other questions related to this? No. Okay. Do you have anything else to add? That's all I've got. We're going to close the public hearing. And I would suggest that we discuss this based on what I guess is in our packets and materials or lack thereof and so we can talk whether the zoning administrator when this was put on our agenda was correct or not so well, the I guess the question is if, if we did a variance on the condition of the use saying that is that how we acknowledge that the, the grocery store is essentially a retail store or is it better to uh, to me, I think that the use component of this, uh, I think that a grocery store is something of a subset of retail. It was retail before. That's what Mr. Dean just told us, a form of beauty shop retail. I think a grocery store is also a form of retail, really, even though it's specifically called out in the land use code, in the land use table as a specific land use. For my purposes, I think the use component of this is, is close enough. Um, I think it's close enough to retail. So I think the use is okay here, but then it turns to the square footage component of this. I have no objection to it. So if this board were to find that um, it's, it's non-conforming as to the square footage allocation, I'm okay with that. So in your opinion, we don't need to rule on the change of use because you're saying there is no change of use. I'm saying it's uh, under the land use table, they're identified as separate land uses. I think they're close enough that I'm not going to object to the use component of it. If you were to look at it from the non conforming standpoint of it, this property is 5,000 square feet or has been used for that, and Mr. Dean wants to continue for using it for that. That's kind of a continuation of the non conforming portion of that. I have no objection to that. 
based on that conversation, Mr. Taylor, is there a motion? Well, I, you know, I, I guess that my, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to make a motion, but I just, or I, I haven't seen where the, where you air, where the zoning administrate, not, this clearly was the, you know, a staff issue that came uh, to you, but where, where the, where there was an error, um, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to make a motion uh, for the change of use and the, uh, and the square footage, but it, it sounds like that, I, mean, I guess I'm not sure what, where, if we're really item a it and it's an error. Procedurally, well, if it makes it easier for the board, you can say that, that, that I erred um, and grant the relief. I, I take yeah, no objection sure. to that. Yeah, and I think before what, as he said, he didn't have certain information okay. until now. So I think when he made the initial ruling, which is what is in right. front of us, okay. you can say. Well, then I'll, I'll, I'll move that, that uh, we find for the appellant that the zoning administrator erred in um, this determination and that we offer the variance in uh, change of use, the change in not conforming use and uh, the square footage necessary uh, for this use so that this property can be used for a uh, grocery store. Okay. We, we have a motion that's been seconded. Any changes, discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck in Woodbine, Flat Rock, great place. Next. Mr. Mr. Chairman, before we take up the next case, Councilman Scott Davis has been able to join us for one of the, a couple of cases on today's agenda, one of which already passed on consent, but wish to address the board with regard to case 2017-114 for property at 1216 Pinnock Avenue. It's been an appropriate time to hear from the council member, I believe. Councilman Davis, please come forward. Welcome back to the BZA, Councilman Davis, and uh, thank you for being here. And what can you tell us about 114? Commissioners, I apologize. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Commissioners, I apologize for my tardiness. I didn't prepare for the weather. Um, at, for case number 114, um, um, it's on 1216 Pinnock. I live at 1010 Pinnock. Um, I've not seen any issues. I've talked to the neighbors, and I've talked to a gentleman that works for Mayor Barry, Mr. Braystaff, and as far as his knowledge, he's had no issues. He lives on the 1200 block of Pinnock, I think two houses down from this. Um, it's a weird case, because this is a duplex. It has two sides, but because of some weirdness, I don't know the code's decision. I respect the decision of the department that it only has one meter or was only allowed to have one meter, but it has two separate doors and, and a firewall separating the other side of the house. One side is a, an affordable rental to a family in my neighborhood. They're a good family, they have a young child. But the other side, the owner has been leasing it out as an Airbnb or vacation rental. Mm -hmm. The owner wants to be in compliance, and I'm not sure if they are, but there's not been any issues, mm -hmm. and they're kind of telling on themselves because they want to follow the rules and they want to follow what the law states. And I know right now in our world, the whole vacation rental view is kind of upside down right now, but I appreciate the hard work of Clint and, and, um, and, and all the staff and John Michael and Terry Cobb, you know what I mean, and this young man right here with the glasses right in front of me to my left. You know, I mean, I know he's very modest, but they've done a good job with the meager resources that the council has provided them and dumping this on them. And I take full responsibility as my part of my 35 brothers and sisters. You've done an excellent job um, dealing with this. And I don't think we should punish this, these nice people. Um, so please, if there's any way that you can grant them permission because they're trying to be in compliance and doing the right thing and not causing an issue, believe me, if they were, my wife would be screaming at me, <laughs> and I love her to death, and they're not causing any issues, and I don't think this place is big enough for them to really throw a wild party anyway on one side of a connected duplex, two blocks from the councilman, and right next door to the mayor's public affairs officer, Sean Bray staff. Okay. So please, I like your yeah. consideration. 
Thank you, Councilman Davis, if you could stand there while I ask John Michael a question. As you know, on Tuesday, past midnight, you all debated a, a couple bills about short-term rentals. And my question to John Michael is, based on pending legislation, what powers do we have here at the BZA related to short-term rentals? I understand the question to be with regard to the board's ability to handle the disciplinary response or the one-year mandatory wait period for properties that have operated without a permit. The answer to that question is there's no substantive change to that That's ability. Right. You can still reduce the one-year mandatory wait period for properties like this one that have never had a permit but have operated, continue to operate today and have multiple bookings on the website at this but But this is challenging a denial of a permit. So. That's correct. We denied it because the property had in so fact operated without if, a permit. If we were to overturn it, what could this person do? Is, could they get a permit today? They could apply. If but, they meet all of the criteria, then they would potentially be eligible. If, in fact, you determined that staff is erred in the pending in legislation thing still in effect? Pending legislation is in effect, but it's not really going to have an effect on this case. Oh, because it's owner. This is a non Oh, I'm sorry. Th no, potentially item number 608 as substituted but not yet amended would potentially affect the application. That's why we always try to remember to say if they meet all the other eligibility criteria. So yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Sorry, so for R and RS zoned properties, type two and type three permits are not presently being issued because of the pending legislation doctrine that attaches to bill number 608. So Councilman Davis, you understand that. So basically because of this bill is being debated in the council, folks next door are not issuing any permits until you all decide one way or another. So this board today is limited in what we can do. I mean, we could, even if we overturn, then if they go next door, it's like, well, we're not issuing these right well, now. I, I understand and I always respect the opinion and the decisions of this board. Uh, we're just trying to basically get it on the record sure because they're trying to, everybody's trying to do the right thing Yes, and then they get there they're the seventh person in line permits are gone mm -hmm. And then they're waiting for God forbid another bad apple to lose there so they yep. can jump on and then you know They try to jump in line and legislation cha changes They're just trying to do the right mm -hmm. thing. Yes, and if you deny that's 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 fine but at least we'll have a record of them trying people okay. trying to be Sure. Apply and do the right thing. But I wanted to get that on the record too and also help you and any or your colleagues and Forest Deliberation to know that this is affecting kind of what's going on next door yes. as we speak, even though this bill hadn't passed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case that will be here. Oh, uh, one item to announce from the previous consideration of our consent agenda, the board had contemplated case number 2017-115 uh, for property located at 4514 Shise Hill Road, a variance request from the front setback requirements, wherein the contextual street setback requirement uh, called for a 90-foot front setback. Uh, the appeal was for a 70-foot uh, front setback, 70-foot front setback. Um, the individual who had sought more information has received more information specifically with regard to stormwater matters. We've encouraged her to take that up with those folks and assured her that any approval by the board was just regarding front setbacks and had nothing to do with the requirements for stormwater. Toward that end, the objection is withdrawn and we would once again recommend that to the board for inclusion on the consent agenda. Okay, uh, case 115 at 4514 Shires Hill Road is back on consent. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Okay, uh, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any other discussion about this? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, it passes on consent. So the parties involved with case 115, John Michael, you, you can- Are now finished with their case, have the approval that they've sought and can approach the Department of Codes as early as tomorrow to begin the process of obtaining the needed permits. Mr. Chairman, case 2017-110 involves the property located at 4204 Belmont Boulevard. There were two separate BZA cases involving this property, two very distinct cases. The latter, the first one on consent, the latter that you'll now hear, involves a request for a variance from the height requirements associated with the construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit. This property is located in the R10 zoning district. Mr. Jason Keckley is the owner and appellant on this particular case. The area of the subject property Property here shown on the portion of Belmont that is really all the way down at the end of Bel Belmont, just past one of the foremost educational institutions in the South, Lipscomb University, and across Shackelford in a quiet portion of Belmont Boulevard. 
The site plan shown here shows the proposed layout for the project that Mr. Keckley seeks from the board today. From my recent site visit, uh, the property from the street, the view in the um, lower right-hand corner is directly across the street, the other two up and down this portion of Belmont Boulevard. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 110? Seeing none, Mr. Cakel, we have the opportunity to come forward and utilize 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board uh, with regard to this appeal request. Hello, uh, I'm Jason Keckley, 4204. Belmont Boulevard, obviously. Um, I made this request. This, this house is one that's been in my family since the 50s. Um, I've spoken to all the neighbors on the street. Um, I actually grew up in this house with my grandparents, so some of the neighbors that are on the street are the same ones that I grew up with. We all have a great relationship. And the property directly behind me that faces Granny White, uh, we abut on the rear property lines, is actually my mom. Um, and so she was uh, obviously one of my greater concerns too that I didn't uh, upset her with what I was trying to build back there. But I've read the, the code and I understand it um, and I believe the, the property adjacent to me on the south side uh, at I think 4202 I assume. Um, but my understanding of this code is that it, uh, under 17.12.060 that I could go up to 45 feet high if this was attached uh, to my home, which is what my neighbor did. After talking to several of my other neighbors, they thought aesthetically that was not very pleasing. I agree with them. Um, I'm looking to just do a detached garage that would allow me to not only park my, some of my vehicles that I use for trucks, or which are trucks, that have high enough garage doors, I can get them in there, which I can't do currently, um, but as well as I'm looking to do, you know, utilize some of the space above it. Um, my house, the lot slopes slightly from front to back, as you may have seen from some of the pictures. So it, while it looks like a ranch, there's actually a lower level. So the height variance that I've requested of 10 feet, getting it up to 26 feet, would roughly match the existing height of my current home. I'm not looking to go any higher than that. Um, that's really all I have. Happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, questions of the applicant. So the, the hardship is the topography is the slope. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, 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 uh, I think I got it. I asked a question, but it really wasn't a question. I'm talking to myself, sorry. Any questions of the uh, board? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay, let's close the public hearing. Discussion. So we have a case in the, um, latter part of Belmont, the end of Belmont Boulevard. Um, no opposition. We Do we have any, we, anything from the council person? No. And there's, and then the variance is just height. I mean, the, the size of the they do and all that, that's not, a, that's, that's all fine and that's all, okay. everything is, it really is just about the height. And yep. that, it sounds to me like there's a hardship with the slope and yep. especially since it's not cresting the mm -hmm. height of the existing home. Would you like to make a motion? Um, sure, I'll make a motion that we uh, grant the height variance um, because there is a substantive slope in the yard and that the variance will not uh, create an outbuilding higher than the existing home. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, it passes unanimously. Thank John you. Michael, I, oh, go back to the last slide, John Michael. Okay, the aforementioned, one of the premier universities in the Southeast, uh, Lipscomb University is under its old branding here on our maps. I would hope that a fine graduate of that university, we can get more up-to-date maps to reflect the excitement that has gone on on that campus recently, since you have graduated, really. Yes. yes. Your, your, your degree probably says David Lipscomb, right? Okay, very good.
Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is case number 2017-112. Tyler Hawkins is the appellant on behalf of LMS Homes, the owner of the property, located at 1910 Warfield Drive, located in Council District Number 25, just off of, uh, not too far off of Hillsboro and uh, close to the Green Hills Mall area. Although the agenda originally identified this as a request for variances from front and rear setback requirements, this is in fact only a request for rear setback variance. Uh, from 20 feet down to 10 feet in this and R10 zoning district for the construction of two single family houses. Although this is a dated aerial photograph that shows the now demolished structure that was there, it does give you an idea of the view of the lot from the aerial view. The site plan submitted gives you a good overview of the proposed layout for the two residential units, the proximity of both the street and the creek that runs along the street. From my recent site visit, um, you see kind of a mess, frankly, with the mud, but nevertheless, we can't help the rain. The view here on this next slide shows the view up and down, kind of coming around the bend on Warfield, which is an unusually curved street at that particular bend, and then the lower right-hand corner of the view directly across the street. This is a case with opposition. I think you had received some letters in your packet as well as feedback from the district council member. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, if you're present, please come forward to make the desired presentation at this time. Because there is opposition present, you'll have 15 minutes to address the board. Should you wish to reserve some portion of that time for rebuttal testimony, please save out of this originally a lot of time. Mr. Hawkins. Thank you. Um, I'm Tyler Hawkins. I am the owner. So the current property is very heavily affected by a, a buffer zone um, on the on the stormwater drain that goes across the uh, front and side of the property. There's a <coughs> zone one and zone two buffer. Um, I submitted it in my in my packet. I don't know if you have it. Um, there's a 50 foot buffer from the top um, of the inside edge of the stormwater drain. So it's it's severely shrinking the actual building envelope of, of the uh, property. Um, in order for me to make this work and be feasible and kind of be in line with the area around it, uh, it would be greatly beneficial to have a 10 foot rear setback. Uh, it would allow us to place the homes in a more desirable location, a more desirable um, appeal to the street um, in order to abide with the buffer zone. I've talked to stormwater management several times, exchanged emails, uh, had an engineer look at it as well. Um, they've indicated that if we went for a variance on the stormwater buffer, that they would not want to allow a permanent structure to be placed in the zone two. Uh, so our thought was that it would be um, more in line with the area uh, to go for a rear setback variance instead of a, a buffer variance. Was, was the previous structure inside one of these buffers? Did it encroach in it the did. buffer? It did. It did. So the, the original structure was actually in both zones, zone one and zone two. So they've told us that in no circumstance whatsoever would, would we be allowed to place a permanent structure in zone one. There are a few occasions where they would grant it for zone two, but they said the likelihood of that is very, very low. So what is the hardship here? Um, I'm, I'm trying to be in line with the neighborhood and make the area nice and conducive. Um, everything else in that area is brand okay. new. There's all two homes. So you know what a hardship is. A hardship is a particular part of this lot or land based on the physical characteristics okay. that prevents you from building this to code. Okay, so in my mind, that is the way the street wraps around the, the property. Uh, as well as the significant portion of the property that's taken up by the buffer zone. Um, I mean, that is my hardship. There's not another lot in there that I've seen that wraps around the corner because actually the buffer zone is coming in on the front of the property as well as the side of the property. Uh, so the percent that it takes away of usable land is significant. Okay. John, I have a question. Um, on a property like this, I don't, I don't know if We've seen a case where you have a home that really is essentially on a corner, but the the street is the same street. And so what, in this case, what do you consider front and rear? Because it seems like if it, if it was parallel to the two houses you see there, it would have a five foot side setback, you know, and so, but yet, I think we're counting that as the rear of at least the second house. 
And so I, 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 my, my question is, how did, how did we determine what was the rear and what's the side on this piece of property where the same road is, has two, two of the sides of the property? So the analysis in part um, is made easy by the existing curb cut here or the street, uh, the driveway that was in place. You're actually crossing a creek in order to create a curb cut back to the, my geography fails me, I guess that's to the due south actually on this side that I'm indicating with the cursor where we see the car in this particular picture. Here at what we we'll guess you'd almost have to call the intersection of Warfield and Warfield. So the fact that the previous structure faced the, this upper portion of the screen, the fact that the driveway is in place there, and the fact that all the other houses on that face do come, obviously have to come right there because there's not really a corner otherwise. So a lot of times the analysis turns on, well, what is the shorter frontage? Are you on a major thoroughfare, like say, if you were closer to, in this case, Woodlawn or Granny White or Hillsboro, and are you on a corner lot such that the shorter frontage is what's appropriate? Here, it's not really a major street. In fact, it's a continuation of the same street with just an unusual curve in it. But the fact that you have the existing driveway is a significant indicator as to the appropriate facing of this okay. particular project. And so so, so the two, so basically the setback to the two houses, the two brand new houses we see in this picture, that would be five foot, that would be considered a side setback. And so the rear is at the very bottom of this page. Is that right? I think that's the right way to say it. It's be five at the side, six between and 20 to the rear. And the challenge on some of these houses like this that are on the corner is that the rear setback on one piece of property may be the side setback on the one next to it, but in, in this case, it does look like it's probably rear setback to rear setback. Um, it, the, the one on Kim I see Bark, what you're saying, and it doesn't seem to be the place if you look down to Kim Bark, yes. Yeah, so so the the Kim Bark, so it really would be the a, a rear, the, the two rear setbacks would match each other, so that might be, I mean, we've had some where a rear, where the rear setback was someone else's side setback, and so you, you th it, it, it was, anyway, that just wanted to get clarification, thank There you. is a driveway on the other side too. There's actually two entrances. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, so we have a letter written yesterday from your council person, Russ Pulley. And he's saying in part, I'm writing today in opposition to the request of a rear setback relief on the property located at 1901A Warfield Drive. I do acknowledge that there are significant stormwater challenges present on this property that limit the amount of developable area. That said, not all properties in our zoning districts need to contain two family units. Given the constraints placed on this property associated with the stream buffer, this is an appropriate location for only one unit, not two units, as in the scope of this variance request. These stream buffers should have been known prior to the purchase of this property, making this a self-created hardship. And this is back to the board. I urge you to not grant a 10-foot rear setback relief for this site. Thank you for your consideration. What do you have in response to that? So even without the 10-foot rear, set, rear setback, so in all disclosure, the rear house will be my personal house. I'm moving from Williamson County to D Davidson County. Um, even if I don't get the rear setback, I can still place two houses. Um, it's just a different shape. So the rear setback allows me to be more in line with the neighborhood, honestly. Any other questions of the applicant? Um, you understand how this works. You make your presentation. We're going to hear from the opposition. Okay. You'll come back for a rebuttal with the time you have remaining. Okay. Any questions of the applicant? Okay. We're going to hear from the opposition now. John Michael. Any of those wishing to speak in opposition, please come forward at this time. Um, you have 15 collective minutes. Those 15 minutes are to be shared. In the unlikely event that there are 30 people that wish to speak, it's advisable to carve up your time accordingly. Please introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board. Hi, I'm Chase Neely. I live at 1905 Warfield. Um, I was chosen from my neighbors to be here today as they couldn't join me at uh, 1903 and 19. 07 Warfield Drive. And board members, you will note in your packet that we have numerous emails in opposition, which I'm sure you've seen, um, including yourself. Okay, continue. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, we understand that RS zoning is a base zoning and that a base zoning like that doesn't entitle someone to build two houses where they'd have to break the rules to do so. 
And so we'd ask that you deny this request. Why does this request, well, how would it impact your property in a negative way? And why are you here to kind of speak out for yourself and others? What's the real sticking point that you object to this? I think the neighborhood has a lot of concerns about adding two houses uh, on that lot. There's a stormwater concern, obviously, uh, with the stormwater that's already on the property. Um, there's also traffic concerns. There are no sidewalks on our street as of this point either. Uh, and it's uh, at its core a dangerous street already. Uh, and we think that this would increase that danger. Do you have anything to say in response to the applicant's testimony today of what he said? Anything you dispute or anything else? I don't. Uh, I think that he cleared it up himself by saying that he could build two houses on this lot even without the variance. So I don't see a point in granting a variance when there's really no hardship. Okay. Any questions of the opposition? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's have the applicant come back further for rebuttal. I mean for, uh, no, not rebuttal, but for, oh, is there any other opposition to this particular case today on Warfield Drive? No? Okay. Floor is yours again. So do you have anything in response to your neighbor or what he said? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd imagine he lives in one of the new houses in the area. So it's just, I don't see how it would affect anything or why sidewalks are relevant, especially when you can't put sidewalks where the stormwater is. So um, he's enjoying the fact of new construction in a nice area. Um, and he lives at 1905 Warfield. Okay, where's that? Is that? It's uh, probably down the street. Okay. So um, I, I personally don't see how it could impact anything whatsoever negatively, even with a 10 foot rear setback. Um, the neighborhood to the left of the property already has a garage that is, it's a detached garage. It is allowed a 10 foot rear setback because it doesn't have a, a livable. Yeah, garages are different issues. Yeah, issue correct. Now. So, um, I mean, I feel like the 10 foot rear setback just makes the house more in line with the, with the area. I mean, honestly, if with the 10 foot rear, rear setback, I'm able to face the living room and garage towards that intersection instead of having to turn the house and make it more awkward um, to the neighborhood. Sure. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? Unless you have questions. Okay, nope, thank you. We're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. So we have letters of opposition, including one from the council person, and we have the applicant requesting this 10 foot rear setback based on stormwater and shape of the lot, I guess. I, I think that there's a hardship. I think it meets the definition of both the, you know, the odd shape lot and uh, whatever the, the storm buffer would fall under, uh, and, and it's interesting. He testified that the the original structure was in the buffer, so there had been a buffer imposed upon the property after that original mm -hmm. structure had been built. So I I don't I don't I don't see this as self-imposed. If anything, it's probably from a stormwater standpoint, making the situation better. Well, the the only the only self-imposed part is what we have a lot with a lot of our applicants is the the choice itself to put you know you know to build to the max that you're allowed and and that often and not just in residential but sometimes even in commercial you know they'll, they'll hit a constraint and they'll say well I can I buy, by right I can have this many square feet or whatever but I have to have so many parking spaces and I just can't do it and it's like well all right, you know, what constraint is ultimately going to keep you from doing this? And so, you know, by right, you can build two, but the constraints are the setback. And although, you know, I, I do see the applicant's point in, in terms of, you know, lining up with, you know, with the garages in the back, I do, I, I see it, but, you know, I, it's uh, a road that I travel often to go to Green Hills, uh, to, you know, the, you're one of those people that cut through neighborhoods. Yeah, well, it's it's just between me and 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 the place I want to go, and 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 it, I, I see the neighbor's point too. It's it it seems to, it doesn't seem as shocking to have some of these square lots have two homes on it, and but this, 
you know, in, in, in one way I was very impressed with the engineering to try to, you know, to see how he actually got two houses here. And the other question was, well, why <laughs> other than you can? So, you know. I, I'm well, sorry. it's still I, a. There was never a the public report. hearing is closed. Well, you never offered public a hearing closed. for people from the community who are going to. I, I asked if anyone yeah, was in opposition did. to speak. I'm not opposed to it. I'm in favor of it. You never offered anybody from the community who's in favor. Of it. If the board wishes to reopen the public hearing, they can do so, but it is appropriately closed per procedure at this point. Still at the board's discretion, either way. Anyone? I mean, I, I tend to rather err on the side of letting folks mm -hmm. speak, so I'm okay. happy to open it up. And then, if please the come forward. So you are here to speak in support of this. I am. Okay. Please identify yourself and your address. My name is Kurt Denny. I live at uh, I live on Woodmont Boulevard at 1577 Woodmont Boulevard. I, however, own the property directly across from this at 1900 Warfield. I also own the property next to that at 1820 Warfield. I uh, uh, lived in this neighborhood for a long time before I moved out of it. That property that I own there is currently uh, a rental property for me. I want to begin by apologizing for interrupting your, um, your, your discussion. I'm not here to be a disruptor, but I do want the chance to speak, and I'm sorry for okay. your disruption. Why are you here in support? I mean, you could have been doing lots of things this afternoon. You obviously own property and on the street. And I, and I was obviously was doing lots of things. Sure. I was um, uh, so working on a Habitat for Humanity house. Thank you. Um, I'm here in support of this because the house that I own at 1900 Warfield Drive is also subject to the same uh, stormwater problems. And my house sits, the house that I own there, sits in the stormwater buffer, which cr was created after I bought the house. This guy bought this house and, and wants, to, wants to build two houses on that lot next door to him and next door to them and next door to them and all the way down the street. The, the, the character of this community is changing and he should be allowed to, to operate that way along that street um, just, like, just like has happened on the rest of the street. And I, I think I speak from a place knowing how this community has changed and I, d I just think he should be allowed to, to do that because it's, it's what's happening on the rest of the street. Well, he's not entitled to do that if he has to come before this board to ask for a variance. He's having to ask for a variance on something that came into effect later in the property's life. Not maybe later when he bought it, but, but later in the property's life. So, and I imagine not knowing, and we're not talking about your property today, but if you were to try to do something, you might have to come in front of here too. But that's, you're saying you're here to support his property because you have a similar property across the street. I, I support anybody that owns property and wants to do something with it. Yes, I'm a property rights supporter, yes. Okay. Any questions for person? We appreciate you being here and uh, we're gonna- Sorry, sorry no, to no, have no, interrupted you. We're gonna discussion. close the public hearing again. Unless there's, is there anybody else wants to speak in behalf of this? No? Okay, discussion. Well, so. I was gonna support what you were saying um, before um, that happened. Um, I still, I think it's still a buildable lot, um, whether or not the variance is granted. So um, that's how I look at these cases. Well, I think that, you know, when you consider the whole property, he's, He's actually building uh, it was certainly no more dense than anything else that's in the neighborhood. If anything, it's less dense because by default, there's a whole portion of the park that they can't build on. And it's not like he's jamming two of the big uh, houses in a smaller area. He's, he's building smaller buildings in a smaller area. But uh, as the overall property is, it's actually less dense than what's going on in the neighborhood. So I, I really don't see it as a burden to anybody. I think the any and, impact. And you thought the storm buffer was a hardship with this oh, shape of the absolutely. Because okay. um, he, he simply can't do anything, and he, and he has he has a a place to appeal that, but it's. I, I mean, I, I agree with him. I think it would be near impossible, and I, I don't think that he would get that appeal to build into the second buffer. Okay. 
Any more discussion? Does anyone have a motion? So why don't you think he gets a second appeal? Well, he gets the appeal. I just don't think that I don't I don't think they're going to allow it, anybody to build any uh, storm buffer. Just given given our recent history. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I just like I said, it, it, it doesn't seem like. I, I, I understand the solution that's presented, but is it, does it meet the hardship? Um, you know, I mean, you, the, you know, there are choices, you know, it's, it's a detached, it's not an attached, you know, which is, you know, uh, clearly the market wants detached instead of mm -hmm. attached, but that's a choice. And, you know, the, uh, the choice was for two instead of for one, because separately they're worth more than singular. So, I mean, they're all, all of these are choices, and I and I get that, and and, and yet I do see a hardship. Um, if you're looking at impact, you know, I mean, how do you weigh that against the council and other folks that are saying, now oh, this probably isn't the right, you know, spot for it? But you know, some of those uh, folks, presumably, if they're in the same block, would be on a piece of property that had a little house torn down and two big houses built in its place. So. Uh, yeah, and if you look at this block with our map, I mean, it's just many lots of two houses and some appear to be even larger than what is proposed. I want to be sure I understand. He's, he's asking for a 10-foot variance. It's five feet now, right? The rear. No. He's asking for a rear it's, variance that's 20. 20. At, the bottom, at the bottom of the chart right. is where... It's supposed to be 20, and he's going to ask for, for 10. 10. So as he pointed out correctly, the neighboring property, I think those are right. two garages or outbuildings that are not livable spaces. If you build one of those, it's 10 feet. If it's a livable house, it's right. 20. But to me, that weighs in his favor because he's on the corner, so that's not impacting. To me, I, d I agree with uh, Mr. Taylor. I think it's a hardship that he has, and I think... I think what he's seeking is reasonable under those circumstances. Does anyone want to make a motion? Or more discussion? Well, I'll try a motion. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually move to deny the variance because it doesn't meet the standards um, of a variance. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor and uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. And raising your hand. And against. It is three to three. So John Michael, remind us what happens here. The board has the ability pro forma though it may seem to solicit a second motion and see if there are four votes in support of that oh, motion fair. in the absence of that we fall into the matter where the case stays open on the for the board's next agenda uh, in the presence of a seventh member would potentially be the deciding vote in that sort of a case okay so um is there another motion mr harper <laughs> well i'll move that that we grant the variance uh and find that the hardship is the uh the storm sewer buffers and the odd shaped lot. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Oh. Okay. And opposed? We got four votes. It passes four to two. So, motion is approved and the variance is granted. That'll bring us to our next case. Mr. Chairman, the next case is number 2017-114 involving the property at 1216 Pinnock Avenue in East Nashville. You've already heard from District Council Member Scott Davis with regard to this subject property. The appeal from Andrew Tillman, appellant and owner here at this property, is an item A appeal challenging the zoning staff's denial of a short-term rental permit. 
the time of the application, there were no type two permits available in that particular census tract. Additionally, there is the complicating factor of the prior operation of a short-term rental um, project there at the subject property without the legally required permit. Uh, staff will stand prepared to provide information from the property standards inspector, Bob Osborne, who joins us today. However, with these photos presented, you have an overview of the subject case. Uh, we can make a little more presentation from the property standards inspector, if you wish, with regard to his findings involving this operation at this particular address. I actually would, considering how short-term rentals have been in the news lately. So thank you for being here. And this is kind of a lesson for all those short-term renter people or would-be short-term rental people. We have a staff that goes and investigates and comes back with findings for this board. So tell us um, what you have found and what you are presenting to us today. So yesterday I looked into the case at 1216 Pinnock Avenue and found a advertisement listed for that property. Um, it looks where, like they have reviews. Where was it an advertisement on? What site? Airbnb. Okay. Looks like they have reviews all the way from November of 2016 through April of 2017. Is that it? Is that it? Right now. You? Okay. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, in addition to the findings from the property standards inspectors, we would note here, and this is some of this is in your packet, should be clear in your packet, there was an application at one time for a permit at this subject property and started the review process by the reviewing agencies. However, after going through some of that process, the permit was never obtained, picked up, paid for, et cetera. Therefore, there's never been a legally issued or I don't think even improperly issued short-term rental permit issued for the subject property. As a result, any operations, including even so much as advertising, represented a violation of the subject ordinance and thus ne uh, necessitated the denial once they did come in for the more recent application on, I believe, March 30th of 2017. And upon that denial, the appropriate appeal here goes to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Okay. Absent any other questions from the board, we'll invite the Let's appellant to come forward. Let's hear from the applicant. Board. Mr. Tillman, if you please introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 114? Is there anyone here in, who is present and wishes to speak in support of case number 114? I guess Very I'm well. here supporting him. I guess we're, we're in this together. So. Yes. You can start. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for hearing this case today. Um, so. Back in November, or what, what? November. Yeah, November. Uh, there was a different uh, management company, so um, that different property manager, and so we applied and had the the property inspected, and by sheer oversight, um, by his his promise, he was going to pay the permit fee, fifty dollars, and it was on his agenda of things to do, and I let everything go. And uh, and I have two other type two short terminal permits and uh, they are both current. They're, they're running properly, all the taxes have been paid. And for this particular property, function as though things were normal. Paid taxes, things of that nature. And so one of them came up for renewal, took care of it, comes to my, my mailbox. And then another one came up for renewal, but this one did not. And so I was a little concerned as to why I didn't come up for renewal. So it, it flagged me. And I try to stay on top of those things because I want to stay current. And so um, I reached out to Clint Harper at Codes and said, hey, I, you've sent me two others. Why haven't I gotten one from you? And uh, he said, well, you never paid for it. So it was never issued in course immediately. But in, in but meanwhile, in that time, uh, staff purchased the contract for managing my particular short-term middle as well as others. Mm -hmm. And so this, she has the information that was passed along to her per the contract I signed with the previous manager. So when did you have your conversation with Clint? Well, I, I wrote him an email March. in March mm -hmm. and we came in immediately after that. Okay. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. And I mean, as soon as I found out that it was not permitted, I notified staff. Mm -hmm. Are you she, still renting out this property on short we, Airbnb? We had long term. Long term. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have some long term stays. It's, it's very common to have long term stays there. It's over 30 days. Yeah. Okay. Which uh, doesn't apply as you know to the. Right. Correct. Well, because we found out and so we're like, right. okay, we need to. Are you, can I speak? Sure, of course. Okay. Um, so I am a rent, short term rental property manager, but I started as a short term rental property owner a couple of years ago. And ma'am, if you'd introduce yourself by yes, name and address for them, just for Stephanie their Stephanie Utterback. My address is 1420 
7 Sumner Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Um, so this is my passion. This is what I do. I, I only take on properties that are in compliance. Um, this, his old management company, I have a contract, poor guy, he signed a contract saying, yes, I will, I will hire you management company to uh, apply for my short-term rental permit and get me in compliance. I have the, his signature for the original company. They told him, yeah, it's all taken care of. Sure, I guess he could have been like, well, show me the permit, but this, is a perf this used to be a professional management company. They wanted out, so they reached out to me because I was currently doing it, you know, managing about eight properties, including my own, um, all in compliance and no complaints. They're all, none of them are party houses. They're smaller houses such as this one that this house averages two to four, mainly two, two people can, can stay in there. You know, that's, that's what we allow. Um, so anyway, so yeah, he's going through the uh, renewal process and he's like, hey, Steph, I don't see, you know, how, how can you help me with this? So I reached out to the original, uh, the owner of the, the management company. I said, hey, what happened? He's like, well, I thought it was permitted. So we have, I have all the original application. He's like, oh, shoot, I, I forgot to pay. I forgot to pay. So this is the original fire marshal went in. Um, it was an over, this was an oversight. This is not us trying to not be compliant. So who said, oh, shoot, the, the former, old management the old company. Manager. Yeah, yeah so and so you would talk to who's MIA now, so we cannot get a hold of him. So he, Drew, Andrew has invested in this property. Um, sure, it's not it's not the, the big, you know, all the furniture, but he's invested in it and he's been doing it, you know, um, for, the, for the guests that we did have, um, not very many. Um, there was, uh, the last one that left yesterday, they were in there for 90 days because we wanted to make sure that we could figure this out. So, you know, uh, it's, we have no issues. There's no issues with this property. Okay. So this is trying to appeal this because of an oversight. And I do understand, I know there's a freeze right now on issuing those, but now there's one permit. The reason why it was, um, when we went back to talk to Clint to see if we can reapply, um, there were negative one permits available. So we're like, dang it. So but maybe we could- even if there were a permit, the freeze applies. No, 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 I'm saying when we went back in, oh, um, right. okay. yeah, okay. so, so, but now we checked last night and there is now one available. And so we are asking, I know there's the freeze, um, who knows what's going to happen with that, but I'd rather this permit go sure. to a okay. small property okay. instead of a big party house. Yep. And if I might add one, th just sure. as far as time is concerned, you know, we, we started this thing over about a year ago, uh, again, this is why we're here, because we thought it was permitted properly. And then we applied this appeal well before this current freeze. Oh, I and understand I, that. And so I think it, if you would just hear that the idea is that we're trying to do everything we can. Sure. And time is against us, it seems. It's just yes. it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But in it's ironic as it could be that I checked the STRP just almost out of habit to see what when it's available. Um, and it was zero, zero, zero until last night. I mean, ironically, and here we are. And so I just was, we're asking, uh, and we did consult with Scott Davis as well through all this prior to this freeze. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's. Okay, questions for the applicant or the management company? Thank you for being here. Okay. We're gonna close the public hearing. So we had one of our original cases of a short-term rental appeal similar to this where someone had trusted a management company and had given them all the things and the management company didn't apply. So to me that this applicant has admitted that he has two other permits, everything's fine, this particular one, and he even had the inspection. So all that they did not do was send that $50 check next door and that's why he didn't have the permit. Everything else was in compliance. So what do we think? I mean, I'm, I'm happy with, um if, I see folks nodding, so if you don't mind, I'll make a motion. Sure. Um, I move that we find that the... Um, oh, we have a, from a staff. Of course you can, please press your button. On their calendar, the next four weekends at least are, are booked. So are they long-term or short-term? Monday through Wednesday is available. Can I ask the applicant? Sure. Come back, sit at the mic. 
so you just heard that according yeah. to online that, that know, we're reopening the public hearing so absolutely so back in March which was last month mm -hmm. we already had because we thought we were in compliance mm -hmm. right but that's what we're that's what we're on the same page we already got bookings for that that time why didn't you so cancel them we, we 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 will absolutely cancel them once once we figure out what's going on here but here's the here's before the, we vote okay here's here's the deal though mm -hmm. with Airbnb because there are checks and balances if you make more than one cancellation, you can never work with Airbnb again. They shut you down. His social security number is is attached to hit. You get we get penalized. So that is what's at stake here. I've never heard that before. That that's you starts. You have super host status, which is what you start with when you when you have great reviews and you're a great host uh, at a three month assessment. You get super host status, which I'm sure you've seen that you've seen people with super host status. If you make one cancellation, your super host status is taken away. Well, we don't, we're not concerned about super. But we're no, no, I'm, I'm just saying this is what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but but after a couple cancellations, because of Airbnb w would like to stay credible, um, they don't want anybody on their, their site that's going to be canceling on people. So I'm uh, just saying it'll I mean, shut everything down. He wouldn't have, be able to do it again. We've dealt with this many times before. I've never heard someone bring that up. That if we if we've had people that I'm happy to show it to eight. you. They they will shut they will shut your account down, and you will not be able to host on there again. Okay. Um, so what? Questions. I, I'm confused with what. What was rented for 90 days? The, the house. Yeah. But it's also rented for the next four weekends. Uh, it's there. There are reservations for those. Yes. Not for the next four but weekends. I when you but found out from over there that basically those reservations were already there from when from before March when we found out that he didn't have the permit those reservations were already there um, we and we did have we didn't have bookings when we found out for from March to uh, to now so we we had somebody that wanted to stay to stay longer so we so gave it to them for th over 30 days I'm, I may be confused so help me understand sure but I thought what I heard you say before was that when we, you found out from codes that you weren't mm -hmm. compliant and you went down and you said, okay, we got to do this right. So we rented it for 90 days. Yeah. So the, the, the 90 days was already currently in a part of started it. started February. Actually, yeah, got a little extended. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a result of finding out that you were doing it wrong. Well, no, we, no, we found that yeah. out. And so he wanted to extend his stay because they're building, he's building a house um, in Lachlan Springs. Okay. So we said, you know what, we're going to let you extend your stay. Yeah. So I will tell you this and everyone watching, this is kind of how we operate. The council has given us authority to hear these appeals is what we're hearing today. Mm -hmm. And the mitigating factors that we use in consideration to either grant these or a lesser penalty of a year when we find that's a violation mm -hmm. is honesty, mm -hmm. is once people find out that they're not in compliance, what do they do after that? And what right. we are looking for is somebody that once they find out they're not renting any additional, Absolutely. and I think most of our board members would agree, we like to see cancellations until okay. someone is in compliance because the law right. says you're supposed to have a permit. And if you basically rent without one, they could come back to you and say, you're out of compliance. And guess what? They could come back right. to us and say, you're suspended for a year. I, no, I, I totally hear you. I completely agree. And I can tell you, honestly, 100%, we have not short-term rented uh, since know, since we found out upcoming uh, because uh, because we were hoping obviously time is against us mm -hmm. and we were hoping to get a permit before then right. and, and and finish but, and pay that fifty dollars so we we're happy to comply we have not done any short term rental since so are you going so to cancel these if if this is if this is where we're, we have to do of course we will cancel those I mean I'm we'll I'm talk we'll talk. And I'm listening as she's the manager, so I'm just listening as. There, there, and, the, and I obviously am not telling you what to do, but there's somebody over there yeah. Yeah. who and I will probably totally be watching you. if these get canceled yes. or not. So yeah. And it's his job to enforce this law. I And if so, there are short-term rentals without a permit, yep. it's his job to tell his department. And I appreciate that because, like I said, everyone I work with is, com is in compliance, and I really, there are the bad apples out there that make us all look bad. So I really, I appreciate what you do. Um, and I can I can 100% say we have not yeah. since we found so, out have done short term. So I will ask you again, and of course this is up to you. Yeah. Are you going to cancel those future 
short-term rentals at this property. If you guys are, if we're gonna deny this, then we, we are forced to, so we will. We want to be, we want to be in compliance, yeah, we want the to. The issue is of compliance, and we were, we were in that, again, mm -hmm. this, as, as an oversight. And then as far as to her point about losing the, the status and, and as far as being kicked out from Airbnb, I have heard this from another manager that, that I have for the other two, that, that if you have too many cancellations, it puts you in a way that the, it's, it almost makes your listing irrelevant. They almost put you out. And, then, and at that point, uh, it's, you know, again, implicating yourself in, in this matter. That's what I've done, we've done. There's a risk involved. We would hate to think that the risk would not only be with the zoning board, but also with Airbnb, because if we comply with you, we, 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 we go, we okay, are we Airbnb, get shot down Airbnb, We are course. here to make sure that the metro laws are being, you know, followed. We, he under, is, we and understand. We're interpreting only, that. We're trying our best. We understand. The only way we could yeah. do that was hope that, you know, mm -hmm. VRBO, for example, would so you know, what, what, are, what are the dates of these future bookings? Um, there's one, um, there's one, I believe, on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday. I already have um, another property that's open if we need to move them, um, and then if we need to cancel. Like I said, I manage um, 10 other properties in compliance, so if we need to move them and cancel and comply, we're happy to do that. So there's only one this weekend? There's no more? No, there, there's a couple more that were previously, they've been on the books for. But, but when are they? Well, I don't have them off the top of my head. Do you have well, the dates? Our, our codes person does. Press the mic. Sure. In, in, in an effort to make it compliant, we could also try to move those to other locations and... It, Either way, we have to cancel yeah. them. Or cancel yeah. them. So are you yeah. saying today that you're going to cancel those in the future or have them move? It, with the hope that we can meet the appeal. Yes. Yes. Mr. Good. Chairman, on behalf of staff, lest there be, conf and I worry that there's confusion both for the appellant and possibly for the board. Mm -hmm. Yes, the renting out of the property on a short-term basis without a permit is a violation of the law. Taking a booking is against the law. Okay. Advertising for short-term rental is against the law. There are already numerous violations, which I do not doubt are going to wind up resulting in a notice of abate and possible warrant thereafter for environmental court. Point being, whether they proceed with these, and I'm sorry to be frank about it, illegal bookings or not is probably pertinent to future endeavors with regard to environmental court. But for the board's analysis today, as soon as they advertised it was an illegality. I realize as soon that. as they booked it was an illegality. Yes. So we're sitting but, here but before the board we, with multiple illegalities yes, but we, still in fact. We also fact. look at mitigating circumstances. And were there any in this instance? The staff would acknowledge that. Well, that's why we're asking them what their future plans are. So, um, questions? Any other questions? I, I was, I'm still unclear on how far out these bookings are. I mean, is it this month, next month? Yeah, August? read us all the bookings that you found online for this address. Looks like there's a booking for the 5th through the 7th, the 11th through the 13th, the 18th through the 20th, the 25th through the 28th, mm -hmm. June 1st through the 4th, June 7th through the 10th, Jeez. the 15th through the 17th. And again, we've had, we've had these bookings since before we found out. Um, and we adver we did advertise before we found out, yes, sure. and that I understand the violation. But again, we found out about we started the appeal as soon as we found out last in March. So was I it, guess March? The, que the question I have is, yeah, you know, it seems like it's really popular. It's booked for the next seven weeks, right? And you found out that you had to be here in late March. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, my recollection of your previous testimony was that you extended the stay of the person that was there mm -hmm. about a month. Right. And so is it just coincidence that you have seven rentals from every weekend from here till the middle of June, but you didn't have a single one in April? Well, we were talking with the, with this couple because they, they wanted, they, they had, I, have, I don't know if I have the original agreement with me, but they wanted original 30 days, but they wanted a little bit of time to figure out because their house is getting renovated for a TV show. So we blocked it for them um, just to see when, when they can get back. And then that's when we found this out. And so we're like, you know what, we'll keep it blocked. Do you need it till, till May 2nd? So we kept it till then. Any other questions? Anything else to add? No, I just, again, um, so let me ask you again, you know, we heard seven yeah. bookings in the future. What is your intention based on those future seven? Where our intention is to cancel it to being compliance. That's what you're going to do. 
Yes, I mean, if it, it really, I don't know if we're able to, this is our first time, my first time appealing. I don't really know how these things work. And I don't know if you were to approve our appeal or not. I don't know if, you, if you're able to approve it, what we need to do then. Obviously, if you're gonna deny it, deny it I know for sure we need to cancel it. Yeah. Well, I'd like to we see haven't too talked that about it. But. If, if we were trying to do something illegal, we wouldn't be here. I mean, if, 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 it, if that matters, if that means anything. I, I do, I'm in real estate full time sure. and, and, and I deal with codes on a continual basis. I don't want something like this to blemish any, anything that I'm doing. I, I try to do things with integrity and uh, sure. we wouldn't be yeah, here same. if that was the case. So, okay. and, and yes, I try not to associate myself with, and again, and, and unfortunately the person prior to her was a friend of mine and it's sure. just mm -hmm. been a hard thing for me to see that happen. And it, I can't fault if it was an oversight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, what do I do? You know, people go, I can't, what are you okay. gonna do to your friend? I'm like, I don't know, he's a friend, you know? So the point is, is that we wouldn't be here if, okay. if, that, if we cared, Thank didn't you. care, excuse me. Thank you, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you guys. for hearing us. Thank you. Close the public hearing. Let's discuss. Um, if there's no discussion, I'm ready to make a motion. Any discussion before the motion? Okay, motion. I move that we we find that the zoning administrator did not err and that this uh, property uh, will be eligible f uh, to obtain a permit July 1st of this year. A second. Okay. Motion's been made. Properly second. Discussion. I think that's an appropriate way to handle okay. the situation. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is the final case to be presented to the board. Case 2017-116, RWN Development, the appellant and owner of the subject property, located at 949 or rather the uh, owner of the property at 949 Southside Place is at issue with an item A appeal. I believe Mr. Dean is representing the appellant in this place. Mr. Dean, please feel free to come forward. Um, the item A appeal is a challenge regarding the height restrictions in this, the R6 zoning uh, district, and essentially a request to cancel a uh, previously issued building permit for the subject property. The aerial here shows some sense with the zoning overlay of the fast emerging section just off of 8th Avenue South. An aerial here shows a lot of the taller developments along Southside Place. Again, this property just to the west of 8th Avenue South, uh, just uh, further south from South Street in particular. The subject property shown here in the street level photographs, the view across the street to the right hand side there, the views up and down the street. As you see, there are very few of the original construction houses along this section of Southside Place and the other streets nearby like 9th, Archer and others, and a lot of new development there. Um, because there are interested parties on both sides of the case, both sides will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, Mr. Dean is formerly the appellant, so we'll get to make the first case and also have the benefit of rebuttal time after those who oppose the item A appeal have a chance to speak thereafter. Obviously, Mr. Dean, you want to save whatever portion of your original 15 minutes for the rebuttal. Um, staff be happy to answer any questions they can along the way, but absent that, Mr. Dean, the floor is yours. Uh, if I might uh, just reserve uh, three minutes for, for rebuttal, uh, hopefully we won't need that much time. Uh, I, I just decided to I passed out some things. It's not quite what I had on the flash drive, but it's close enough. <laughs> um, this is a little bit of an unusual case. Uh, I represent the neighboring property owner. Um, uh, my client owns the property at 908 Archer Street. <laughs> um, the appeal regards, however, uh, joining I don't know if it's adjoining or not, but they back up to each other, uh, 949 Southside Place. Um, and if you're looking at the, uh, the map on the monitor, and I hope I get this right, the, uh, you see the R6 there kind of in the center. That's the subject property. That's uh, 949 Southside Place. My client's property is coming down. Uh, I, whoops. No, that's Archer, I guess. I've got it backwards then. Uh, it's, yeah. The, the, no, no I, I had it right. 908 Archer is my client's property. The property immediately 
uh, above it on that diagram with the R6 on it is the subject property that we're talking about here today. Uh, I will just say that if you, um, and I don't know what direction I'm going, probably north on the diagram, downtown Nashville is above uh, both properties uh, as ori oriented on that uh, diagram. The reason that's important is that my client is concerned about the height of the property adjacent to it because it blocks his property's view of downtown Nashville. So the question here is the height of the property located at 940, I've got 949, is it 946, uh, uh, John, I may have written the wrong number down. I believe it's 949. Okay, okay. I wrote it right then. Uh, so essentially, if you just look at it from the standpoint of my client owns property that has a view on downtown Nashville. The subject property that we're talking about here uh, was built in a way above the height restrictions we believe that are established by the zoning ordinance and that interferes with the ability of uh, his property to see uh, the skyline in downtown, downtown Nashville. More importantly than that, uh, that, that's what really brings the case to us, but more importantly than that, the question really is how high can you build a property uh, in the urban zoning overlay in Metro Nashville. And Mr. I know- King, I'm sorry, can I interrupt him? Yeah. All these pictures that are in front of us, the one on the left is the subject property. Is the one on the right your client's property? Hardly, I've been there, but I don't- No, and that's, an, um, that's my fault for leaving Mr. Dean hanging on Thank that. You. The subject <laughs> to the right is across the street, and thus the view back toward downtown to the north. Um, sorry that I did not know which exact property was owned by Mr. Dean's client. I would have photographed that and shown the proximity. Apologies to the board for that. Okay, so okay, so we don't have a photograph of, of that property. Uh, of my client's property or yes. the subject property? Your client's property. Probably not. I'm, I'm not sure that I even thought of bringing uh, a photo of that. I because just was trying to see. You know, on the yeah. one map, there was nothing on it, so I, I wasn't sure he had Right. And, and both of these properties were being constructed roughly about the same time. Um, uh, let me, um, I, I wanted to set the stage so that, that uh, you'd understand why I'm here, essentially. And, and I do think that... Um, it's been kind of a, uh, uh, an issue that's kind of run back and forth. Uh, at, I don't know how many years ago it was. It was before Bill was here, and probably none of the members of the board were on at the time. Uh, uh, I represented, uh, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Ewing was on the board at the time anyway. Uh, rep represented uh, John Rich, a big and rich, on his property in Love Circle. And there was a concern then uh, about the, um, the height limitation uh, at the time, there was no restriction on, of total height limit. You could go up three stories, and the issue in front of the board at that time had to do with how uh, tall could each individual story be. I don't know whether the, the law was changed as a result of that case or not, but in, in the instance that we have here, the property that that's, is at issue, uh, the, the Southside Place property, uh, is, and both of them, I guess, are in the urban zoning overlay. The restrictions on the height on a property in the, over zo uh, uh, the uh, uh, zoning overlay essentially says that you can't exceed three stories to a maximum height of 45 feet. There was a previous case where we were discussing, the board was discussing accessory structure, uh, the, the same 45 feet essentially. Maximum height shall be measured from either the natural grade of present or from the ceiling of an exposed basement. Uh, uh, Mr. Clint Elliott here on my right is uh, the surveyor who went out and the first page of the two documents that I handed to you were the, um, uh, the survey, the as-built survey that uh, Mr. Elliott did. And you'll see that the top, uh, I wanna make three points about this um, diagram that uh, Mr. Elliott put together. Uh, first, uh, there is a bulkhead at the very top. Uh, you'll see he's listed at top of structure 589.45. So at the very highest point, the property is this bulkhead at 589 feet 0.45. There is also a parapet wall that's at 584.35. And based on his calculations, the average grade, the natural grade, the elevation uh, at the base of the property is 537. If you measure from the um, uh, average elevation to the top of the parapet wall, you're at 46.89, two feet over the 45 feet that are the maximum permitted. And if you uh, go to the top of the uh, bulkhead, 
uh, you're at 51.997 feet above the maximum permitted by the zoning regulations. I want to point out that and in talking with um, uh, Bill Herbert, Bill has told me that in the past, the codes administration has essentially ruled that a bulkhead is okay, that, it, that it's a permitted obstruction within the uh, uh, height envelope. And hence this appeal, my clients were told when they came in for their permit that they could not put the bulkhead above. Uh, and so what has happened, I'm sure, is that the builder on the subject property, Southside Place, was told one thing, my clients were told something else. We filed the appeal because we think that what we were told actually is right, that, that you cannot uh, go above the 40, it's a hard limit, 45 feet. The reason I say that is that there's a provision in the same part of the zoning ordinance that I was reading from before, this is 17.12.060, dealing with building height. There's a special section for permitted height obstructions. It only applies in mixed use and non-residential districts. Uh, this is subsection D. In mixed use and non-residential districts, the following structures shall be exempt from the height control standards of this section. Uh, uh, subsection three says stair bulkheads, and subsection six says parapet, fall, parapet walls not more than four feet high. So if you're in a commercial zoning district, or in a zoning district that allows multifamily residential, uh, you can't, you, you've got the, the height limitation, but a permitted obstruction would be a bulkhead or a parapet wall not exceeding four feet. It would have been easy to say that those uh, obstructions would be allowed in residential districts too. The drafters of the ordinance did not say that. It's not there. This property is in a residential district. Both of these properties are in a residential district. Um, and as a result, the bulkhead, which is clearly uh, above the permitted height of 45 feet, and the parapet wall are both in excess of the 45 feet that are uh, permitted by the zoning resolution. And really, we're here to ask not that the building permit be revoked. Uh, certainly, the owner of the property on Southside Place had the right to get that building permit. We just think that the the uh, uh, bulkhead and the parapet wall are above the height limitation and should be removed. The building can stay, uh, but there, there's a violation, we believe, of the zoning regulations by virtue of the bulkhead and the parapet wall. I, there's a second diagram, a second uh, page, not a diagram, uh, it's a table, uh, that is attached to that survey that um, uh, Mr. Elliott uh, did. Uh, and what I've, there's a, a survey, an as-built survey from the owner of the property, actually four different diagrams that have been submitted. And what I wanted to point out on this, it looks like this, this, my little, you'll see my little red arrows. Um, the first red arrow there in the center of the page, the point of that is that using the elevations from the owner of the property, uh, who I'm sure will speak next, and from us, uh, the, the average of the natural grade, you, don't, you do not measure it from each of the four corners up to the top. You, do, you get the elevation at each of the four corners at the bottom and average those and then go to the top, take the top point and subtract. Uh, if you do that, if you take the owner's uh, uh, numbers for the elevation, uh, on the left-hand side of that first red arrow, he came up with 537.72. Ours was 537.46. So we're talking about a very small discrepancy there. So the point is that the natural elevation of the property at the base of the, the, the footing of the property, uh, both surveyors came up with very similar numbers. Uh, where the dispute takes place is the top of the building. And you'll see the next red arrow, uh, the height shown on the as-built from the owner shows 580 feet high, and ours shows 589 feet high. And I'd suggest to you when you look at the builder's, the owner's diagram, that essentially it looks to me like they're going uh, from the deck of the roof, which is probably not a problem. The difficulty he has is that he doesn't show where the parapet wall is that height, or the um, height of the uh, bulkhead. 
And so the only numbers the board has with regard to those things are, were done by Mr. Elliott. I'd suggest that's the discrepancy, and the reason the discrepancy is there is because the owner thought that he could build those above. You, pursuant to the zoning regulations themselves, you cannot. Uh, the, the law does not permit the uh, construction of the parapet wall above the maximum height set for residential structures. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the two circles in red on that table, the first one shows our, the top of the bulkhead is 589.45 feet minus the 537.46 feet of our elevation, puts it at 51.99 feet, uh, uh, virtually 52 feet. Again, the maximum permitted per, per the zoning regulations is only 45. Uh, similarly, with the regard to the top of the parapet, it's 584. Again, the uh, uh, average of the grade at the base is 537.46, so that once again, the total at, at the top of the parapet wall is 46.89, almost two feet above what's permitted by the text of the zoning regulations. Um, we had tried to talk to, we, we, we complained to codes about this, um, uh, and I think what happened is it depended on who you talked to about whether or not uh, this was seen as a violation or not. Uh, we spoke with um, uh, one of the building inspectors who talked to Richard Thomopoulos, and Richard's an old friend and does a great job for codes, but I respectfully submit to the board that the interpretation that uh, the codes administration may have been using is just not correct. Uh, the, the language of the ordinance says that the maximum height is 45 feet. Uh, it doesn't say that in a residential district that you can have a permitted obstruction of a bulkhead or a parapet wall. It says you can have those in a commercial zoning district, but not in a uh, residential zoning district. And I'd, and I'd add that if you can uh, uh, take a parapet wall, for example, suppose you did a parapet wall that was 10 feet high. If you could build to a 45 foot maximum height and then add 10 more feet over that because the parapet wall is, is an, a permitted obstruction, then essentially now you have a 55 foot uh, uh, structure. Yeah, Mr. Dane, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. you. You're at three minutes um, and I just wanted to make you aware of that, but also um, to ask a question. You, you describe this as a parapet wall, but it also seems to function as a, a railing for the roof deck. Is there a difference in the code between a parapet wall and, I mean, I understand it, it appears to be a parapet and it appears to be a fence. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, uh, uh, it would seem to me that uh, a railing that you could look through would be, a, would, would be an appropriate thing. I, certainly you wouldn't want people walking off of there. On the other hand, if you can't have the bulkhead up there, I'm not sure how people get up there. For, or how, for or how, if you can't have a bulkhead, you know, how could you have a railing? Yeah. Or would there be a difference? Um, I, I, and I appreciate the fact that this is, I, I talk, I've talked to Bill Herbert about it, and uh, uh, he told me, you know, that um, Codes has looked at it from the standpoint of allowing these things. And I said, well, you know, if you, but, but when you just read the ordinance itself, it's pretty clear that um, the, and, and again, I wondered if it came out of the uh, controversy on Love Circle as a result of the, um, uh, the John Rich uh, construction, and it may not have, I don't know, but um, uh, at that time there was no maximum permitted height for residential structures as, as far as I was aware. Um, uh, it seemed to me that maybe this was put in in order to take care of that problem and that they specifically uh, decided that uh, they be in the Metro Council not to um, uh, have the permitted obstructions that they were gonna allow in um, uh, commercial district. Most of the time, residentially, the air conditioners and those kinds of things are on the ground, on the ground anyway, and so not many obstructions necessary on, on the top floor of a uh, residential structure. And the, in my notes, I have um, 45 allowed, but they built 55 feet, and I, I'm taking, I think that was in something that was submitted maybe earlier, but your testimony is that the maximum violation is 52.99 or 51.99, right at 52 feet. It, it never right. went 55 feet. Right. That was based I don't, on. And I apologize if, if I put something no, in. No, no, it may have just been, it may yeah. have just been that you got, ex, you know, the expert testimony yeah. after that you knew there was a problem. Anyway, I just wanted to make sure that I understood that. And I may have written it down wrong, but I, I, I when I was following it in my notes, uh, I had that. And then it said something about a 30-day window. 
Is there is that an issue somewhere? That was there, I, I saw some of the codes folks had written down 30 days. I think what that reference is, and, and Bill may correct me if I'm wrong, is that there has from time to time been a thought of a statute of limitations on an appeal by a neighbor. As far as I know, there's not really one in the zoning ordinance. Um, uh, in fact, when in 1998, when the new zoning ordinance was passed, I actually argued for putting it in. Um, uh, it was, it, unless Bill corrects me, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that there, it's in there. Uh, so I, I think the thought was that maybe there was some uh, statutory time frame within which we'd have to file the appeal. I, I don't think that that's there. We, we did make complaints as early as January of this year saying, listen, there's something wrong here because this building is higher than what, it should, what we think it should be. Uh, and again, it causes, from, from the standpoint of my clients, they're, gonna, they're not going to live in this property. Uh, uh, they built the property. They want to sell the property. And they think that the property is going to lose you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of value as a result of the inability to see the skyline downtown. Are there any other questions I'd any, respond to? Any questions? Okay. Well, Thank you. I, I just have, I want to ask Mr. Dean because I always respect his opinion. But if what Codes is saying is, I understand you're saying they're incorrect, but if this is what they're saying is this is how we interpret this, can you just not build the same way? Uh, yes, that's, that's a possibility. Now, uh, I don't know on the property that we're talking about that they could make those kinds of changes at this point. Uh, 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 my clients are, very concerned, however, about the Southside Place property, okay. and uh, I, they, they, they mentioned that to me that, well, if the board ruled in this way, it probably means that we could build that way too, and I said, yes, that, that's true, but they're, they, they don't see that as a, 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 a very helpful situation for them, really. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chairman, on behalf of staff, you'd raise the question about the 30-day question, uh, the 30-day issue that had been mentioned in some portion of your board packet, and I think it'll be to the benefit of Claire for the to, for clarification for our audience as well. A final site plan determination by the zoning staff is something that is subject to appeal within 30 days of that final site plan. I think that was a question raised by one of our staff members, and I think rightly so. However, in this case, the challenge is not to the site plan itself, which actually showed the correct numbers and designations as to bulk regulations, including height, but in fact what got built in the field. So in all likelihood, this is not something that is subject to that 30-day restriction because what's being challenged is the height that actually got built. Actually, a person wouldn't know how tall it was going to be in the field until it in fact got built. So it's not about the site plan, but the actual construction, thus probably not barred in any way by that 30-day provision from 17.40. Okay. That's good to know, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, Ron Lair's here who works with the company and he'd like to have uh, make a couple of comments. I understand it'll take some of my time, but, but certainly that's fine. Okay. If the board's willing to listen. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ron Lair. I uh, am an agent for the uh, owner of uh, 908 Archer. And I wanted to bring up uh, or just clarify two points that, uh, that came up uh, here. And that was, I think this is an issue of consistency because when uh, when we first went to apply for our building permit, and that was uh, way back when uh, Pierre, some of you know Pierre was there, and, and we were told very explicitly at that point that uh, we, uh, the highest point of our uh, of our house could not be more than 45 foot. In our particular case, we we had a, an elevator, and so we had the elevator shaft that was uh, was going to exceed the 45 foot, and we were required to change our our house by pulling it down to a maximum of the 45 foot. Uh, that was not an issue uh, for us, but that's what we were told. So w we understood that that's what the what the code uh, was. Uh, when we when we did that, and when this other house was being built in front of us, we did try to mitigate with uh, with the owner. Uh, the minute that we saw that that house was going over what we uh, at that point knew to be the 45 foot, we we did provide notice. Uh, so I, I think that should be, you sh you folks should know that they had every opportunity to. Uh, 
uh, at that time to at least defer and, and get clarification regarding the continuing of, of the building and going over. At what, at uh, what point of their building, when, when that was communicated, at what point? At that they point, uh, they were framing the, the third level and, uh, and it became obvious to us that they were framing a, a stairwell that would go to the deck. So with that stairwell uh, and where, where the third level was located, we knew that they were going to be over. Matter of fact, uh, I went up with our builder and we dropped a plumb line at that point. Uh, to, and so we were very close to what, uh, uh, what Clint uh, here subsequently uh, uh, measured. The other thing I want to mention, and I think it's, it's a very significant consistency problem with, with the code. We, uh, I represent some other HPR our builders and right now we're uh, in process of applying for uh, for for eight units up on Fern Street that's uh, that's going to be three level uh, and uh, I was told as recently as less well less than 30 days ago by uh, Clint Harper when I went in to talk about uh, the permit and what we could and couldn't do and I was told very very clearly that we could not have a a stair bulkhead on the top that exceeded the 45 foot which of course is uh, is exactly our issue with dealing with uh, with 908 Archer so I just wanted to clarify those things and I appreciate uh, you allowing me to, to add that comment Great, any questions you. for me thank you I, I'm happy to suggest that we give each side an additional five minutes if that's sure. okay with you all since it's a complicated case and I don't know that uh, who all will need it, but uh, I would like to have time for Mr. Dean to uh, to rebut and uh, basically to have all the points out that need to be out. So if, if that's acceptable, we'll we'll do that. So uh, Mr. Dean, you'll have five minutes and 19 seconds to come back. And anyone, uh, I guess it's the the property owner or anyone who supports us. Uh, It's an item A, so I, I'm not sure about support. <laughs> I'm going to get it to reconfigure. But uh, it, it, the owner of the property and, and anyone else that would uh, speak to uh, allowing or, or believing that this property was built correctly uh, can come forward. And you will have 20 minutes, uh, in fairness, to both sides to have that additional time if necessary. Uh, my name's Harold Johnson, 914 Villa Place. I'm the owner of Progressive Development. Uh, I'd like to pass out some documents with you guys. Uh, this is uh, the Metro Code, and I have it highlighted. And Chairman, yes, I'm sorry, sir. but before we start the assessment, can we take just a two or three minute recess? That would, is that acceptable? I, I think that would be great. Um, so if, if you don't mind, we're going to take about a, you know, quickly three minutes. We've been here a long time. Take a quick three minutes. And, I apologize. And then come back. Uh, that way you're right here for the whole thing. But. We'll take a short break and reconvene.
to talk, the neighboring property owner's representation for the item A appellant, along with the zoning administrator, so they could review some of the questions regarding height determination. Um, we don't do it all the time, but we from time to time do take breaks specifically so that people can talk and see if there's a meeting of the minds on any of the issues of the cases. Uh, although there were those discussions during that break that were not part of the hearing, now that we can reconvene with the hearing, everything's back on the record and part of the hearing once again. Well, great, and 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 just also for the record that the uh, the board took a break and we were here and the parties were on the other side of the room and 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 as we do very frequently uh, ask people to, to have a conversation because if certainly things can uh, come to conclusion without uh, being settled here, it's uh, it's advisable and and always good. Uh, but uh, we are going to continue with our hearing, and again, the the board was was not part of any of those conversations. It was something with the, uh, the uh, uh, both sides in this, in this uh, appeal process. So uh, at this point in time, we, are, uh, we have heard from the uh, folks who are requesting the item A appeal, and now we're hearing from the property owner uh, who owns a property that uh, is in question in terms of, of the height. So and we're going to start the clock back at a full 20 minutes for, and let you just start fresh, since I know you'd kind of gotten off to a start when we interrupted you before. I'm sorry. Could, I'm sorry. Could turn your microphone on. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, the first, the first item I'd like to call to your attention would be the uh, appeal for final site plan action. A final site plan action by the zoning administrator may be appealed by the applicant. Uh, to the Board of Zoning Appeals, the approval for the final site plan by the zoning administrator may be appealed to the Board of Zoning Appeals by a non-applicant within 30 days following commencement of construction as defined by 17.04.030. I pulled this permit in September uh, 21st of 2016. Um, one issue that I have is these guys are just now filing this. You know, I've been under construction uh, uh, for, for some time right now. We're, we're about 90% complete with this project. I have stucco. I have all this money tied up in my framing. Uh, and the, I, I have major uh, issues with that, with that respect right there. They, they should have come to me. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll go to your second page, um, and these are the three pages stapled together, uh, the very first page, even if they had a problem with, with the height of it, I had my framing inspection. If you look at that uh, towards the bottom of the page, the framing inspection was complete on this on February the 1st of 2017. They have filed this thing uh, in April, if I'm looking at this correct, it looks like, uh, no, it looks like uh, May the 30th of 2017. So even if they have the issue, they're still with, out of the bounds with, with, with their 30 days to, to, to appeal this. Um, that, that, that's my first uh, item that, that uh, I would like to bring to you guys' attention. Um, also, I have an, more documents I would like to hand out to you. Have you been issued a stop work order or no, anything? No, okay. sir, I have not. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we, we've submitted our as built to the building codes and, and we're given granted permission to, to continue with our, our construction. Uh, if you look at the building height controls, 17-12.060, single family and two dwellings shall not exceed three stories to a maximum height of 45 feet. Maximum height shall be measured from either the natural grade or if present from the ceiling of an exposed basement not more than seven feet above natural grade. The natural grade shall be determined based on an average elevation of the foremost exterior corners of the structure to the eave of the roof deck. Natural grade is based on ground elevations prior to grading. Um, so if we average all this up, 
we're measuring to that roof deck. If, if y'all observe the picture up there, that the, the roof deck it, it is the center part. It's not the parapet wall. It's not the bulkhead coming out of there. The, the actual roof, the bulkhead only constitutes maybe one to 2% of the entire structure. And, and it does in no way qualifies as a roof. The, the, the roof is the actual roof deck that, that's down up there. Um, and then to the eave, which is the overhang, and uh, the, the, the eave it w would also be the, the, the little overhang right below the parapet wall. And uh, uh, I really couldn't find it in the zoning code, but uh, I pulled two or three definitions on the internet fr from, from a, a Google search up d describing what, what the eave is. Um, I too had a, uh, an as built uh, completed on this, uh, and this is what I had to, to, to submit to, to the Metro codes prior to coming here today. Uh, and this, this as built states where my rooftop deck is, and uh, I've even taken the liberty of doing the, uh, the elevations and, and subtracting 536 from the 580 on all four corners. Uh, uh, of the property, and my average height is only 42.11 feet. Uh, I know Mr. Elliott has done this, and he, he even has his parapet wall, but if y'all could go back to the picture of the very front of the house, when Mr. Elliott went out there, we had our footers dug up where we were waterproofing and had our sock drain and all that. We had been even backfilled our, our, our footers yet. So, I mean, for him to 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 not even that the parapet wall would, would be a big issue because I've just read code, but when they did this survey, that they were going all the way down to, to, to base gray where we had dug into the ground to, to, to waterproof our footers and our block. Yeah, I mean, the way I read, the way I read um, this is the numbers that you've presented are fairly consistent, um, and that is that the, you know, the grade, um, you both are kind of saying the grades at the same spot. I mean, you're, there's a half, uh, maybe a half foot difference, six inches, and and I'm not going to get caught up on six inches. We're talking, you know, we're talking about seven feet, and anything under a foot, we'll just say, yes, sir. That uh, if if it gets to that, it, it's it's a lot further down the road. Okay. But I see, you know, I see the difference really being in in whether the the parapet and the in the uh, stairwell count or not, because it sounds like, it, it, it seems to me like you, the number that you're saying is, is 42 to the deck of the roof. Mm -hmm. And there's, and I think that their numbers pretty much agree with that. Okay. They're just saying when you count the parapet, which they say you're not supposed to, and then when you count the stairs, that's where you get the seven feet. So it, it, it seems like your, your numbers match okay. close enough. Yes, sir. Okay, um, I'd like to pass out more documents with you guys. And I'll say it's not a bad thing that your numbers do match fairly closely because then it, <laughs> it, 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 become, it, it pulls it into to that question of, 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 of uh, is, does the parapet count or not? Yes, sir. Okay, myself, like Mr. Elliott, uh, I also have a drone too. Uh, this weekend, I took it out there and I flew it over my structure. Uh, that's a picture of my house, but if you look in this uh, top far right-hand corner, uh, you'll see a large development going on right here. Prior to, to, to doing my house out here, I was very inspired by this development. Uh, I'd say it's a good 30, 40 homes setting on it. If you'll flip to your second page, everybody out here has the same bulkhead. I had my architect draw the exact same plans for this. I submitted my elevations, which match up to the as built, and and uh, that that's how I obtained my permit. Uh, I, I, that, that's 
pretty much, I mean, we, we, we've got everybody else in the neighborhood with, with the exact same bulkhead. It, it has to be a, a legal structure. Uh, uh, so, um, Did you have a question? I was thinking I had a question and I'm not sure I do yet, so <laughs> keep going. Uh, okay, um, after we got, we was about halfway through with our stucco and uh, you know, I received a call uh, from, from my, my building inspector, uh, Chuck Hayes, and he, he was requesting the as built. So we, we submitted our as built to Mr. Hayes and when, when I give him that, um, When I'd given him, given him the, the information or ass built, um, I, I was granted permission to continue construction on my home. This is a sent email uh, of where I'd sent my ass built to, to Mr. Hayes. And now we're about, I'd say a good 95% complete with this project. Uh, we're, we're, the, this this would cost a fortune to, to yank all this down after I've invested so much in all the stucco and the metal roof and framing and, and I mean I, I don't feel that this bulkhead constitutes the the uh, the eave of, of a roof. I mean I'm sitting here reading the, the definition of an eave of a roof and and by no means does that qualify for the eve of a roof? That that does not overhang off of any four corners of that property. It's located dead in the middle uh, uh, of the of the home. The, the eve of the roof is the overhang where, where the pair, where the wall meets the, the the roof line. And that and that's all that I had. I, I appreciate y'all listening to my arguments. And if y'all have any questions, please. Feel free to ask them. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. Um, usually, it, I don't know if the zoning administrator, Phil, if you have anything that you uh, would like to comment on. It's uh, needless to say a complicated case that one we haven't heard, our, this current body hasn't heard before. Right, right. Um, so Mr. Dean is correct in that he mentioned this to me a while back. However, right now is the first time that I have seen um, either one of these ass belts. Um, so I haven't had the chance to, to look at them or review them. Does it make sense? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you all feel, but I, and, and I don't know how the other parties feel. I know that, that it was discussed and we weren't party to any of that discussion of, of how to um, to get enough information. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I would love to have you have more information for us, and I don't know if you need more time for that and if it would be helpful to have more time. Well, it would, and um, I had approached the uh, parties during the intermission to see if we could agree on a deferral of the case. Um, you know, this is, it's a situation where we've got basically two code sections pitted against each other. Mr. Dean is correct that the section he's referring to, it, it says what it says. Um, the other section says what it says, and it, it says that you measure height from natural grave 45 feet to the eave. Um, so, um, um, it seems like we've got um, a statutory um, conflict here. It's um, a situation where um, the um, uh, property owner is, is correct. There's um, a number of structures throughout the county that have been built that have rooftop decks on them with access to those decks through an stairwell bulkhead or elevator. Um, um, I've not had the opportunity to, to really look at this and see if there's a resolution between these two sections. Um, I had asked for perhaps a, a deferral so we could do that. Um, I understand that um, there's some current concerns between the parties. Um, I understand this property is, is now for sale. Um, and if I would invite the continuance to allow us to look at it, 
Um, I understand Mr. Dean's client may have an objection to that, and if there is an objection to that and this board wants to go ahead and rule, then that's okay, and both sides can appeal it up and can work its way up through the court system. What? Okay. Well, can I ask, can I ask Mr. Herbert just a question or two? So there is a, seemingly a conflict in the, in the two statutes. So do, do you have a policy in place now? I mean, obviously the right answer is we follow the law, but I'm, what do your examiners or are they instructed or have you ever discussed, you know, do parapets count in the 45 feet, do bulkheads count in, in this particular zoning? I, I'm an architect and I, I mostly do commercial and we, we were, I, I'm sure people that do different types of architecture might have different views on this. I, I was under the assumption that all of the parapets, bulkheads, chimneys, things like that are, were okay to, to exceed just like they are in, you know, sky planes and stuff like that. I, I did not realize that in residential it, it was, it was different. So I mean, so I, I guess I'm saying I'm sympathetic if a code reviewer given the amount of stuff they look at might blur those lines in their own mind. So is there a policy? I mean, if somebody before today had asked you, hey, can I have a parapet above 45 feet if my roof deck is fine? I mean, what, what would have you been your, so your I can, gut answer? I can only speak historically on this because this has never landed squarely in front of me until this particular case. Um, I understand that historically that uh, my predecessor had um, allowed um, parapet walls and elevator shafts and um, stairwell bulkheads to um, exceed the 45 feet. Um, uh, our staff, we have a mixture of very experienced zoning examiners that have been there for many, many more years than me. And um, they have been operating under um, the guidance given to them under the former zoning administrator and have been carrying forward. We also have new staff who um, look at the zoning code and apply it quite literally. So I think the fairest answer to the question is, and it probably is what has played out in this situation, is that uh, the property owner here had one of our very experienced older staff members who reviewed the plan and okayed it as was was instructed under the, the prior zoning administrator. Um, Mr. Dean's client, unfortunately, or fortunately, drew one of our younger zoning examiners who read the code quite literally and denied their plan. Very unfortunate situation. Um, that's just the reality of it. Um, this is, I have not had this put in front of me until this case. I also wonder, uh, you know, Mr. Taylor had mentioned, you know, these numbers are, are close, the two parties have very close numbers, it's really about definition and that got me thinking about, I, I know that with other zoning issues sometimes, I, I won't call it a fudge factor, but I know that, or I'm assuming that, that the administrator has uh, a, a little bit of uh, discretion if, you know, if, you know, if there's 500 parking spaces, you know what, we, when we got out on the site, you know, we've only got 498 spaces, you know, do I have to come back for an appeal for those two? I mean, it, what kind of leeway do you have to make a decision administratively on some of these things before you say, no, that's something you're gonna have to appeal? Or does that, would that even apply? I mean, it seems to me that it could apply here. It's like, you know what, we framed it, this change, this change along the way, no one thought about it, but now that we're at the end, it looks like we're six inches too high. You know, is that something you guys say that, you know, hey, that happens or, you understand what I'm asking? Or? Yeah, uh, so I can only really speak to it with respect to the zoning code. And so the interpretation of the provisions and the language within the zoning code um, is, is my responsibility and, and my staff's responsibility. Um, so to the extent that we've got conflicting provisions um, that could be read differently, that ultimately lands on me to have to decide that. Um, my, the former zoning administrator evidently had decided that and decided it in, in such a way that uh, Mr. Dean is now calling into question. Um, so, I mean, that's all I know about it, quite frankly. Okay. Thank you. 
I was just going to say, I think I've heard enough at this point. Uh, to me, it's not just about this case, but it's about a lot of cases that are going to come forward in the future. And it seems to me that it's appropriate for the zoning administrator to have time to look at this and make a decision um, about that interpretation. And I think we need that guidance in going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. And in all fairness, I'd like for, for both sides to be heard on that. I think Mr. Yeah. De Dean's client deserves um, an opportunity to just say something uh, about it if you're okay with that. Well, and, you're, yeah, you're referring to the deferral. Well, or, what I, I, yes. What, well, and, and I would almost say too, though, that um, that the um, the appellant has, I think, five minutes and 20 seconds left uh, for their presentation. We could hear the full presentation. That way we've heard the whole case, still defer it, and then um, we'll basically have heard from everybody, and then, uh, you know, we will decide, I guess, it, it, the deferral, whether or not to completely rehear the case or have the five of us uh, continue with it. And I think that's some, that would give us that opportunity to, to continue or to... Uh, it, depending upon the constitution of the, the board, if we have all seven of us, uh, you know, at, at, at a future date. But um, it's complicated. It has enough implications. I, I tend to agree, too, that, that it, we should give uh, the, the zoning administrator time to, to reflect. And I have no doubt that, uh, I mean, you know, we all have things that just come up for the first time. And, and if you look at this hill and what this hill has done in the last, you know, five years, um, who would have thought that we would be looking at these kind of views in the city and that this height would matter and, and it is totally understandable. So, uh, but I do want it to be thorough because I do think it's precedent setting like, uh, like you said. So, uh, if you have anything else to add, we'll hear from, um, hear from the appellant. Um, I did have one more thing to add. I, I know that they'd spoke with uh, M Mr. Elliott, and I've always dealt with Richard Thomopoulos. He's been there for forever, so that's who I, I, I went to, and I, I really hate that Mr. Elliott or uh, M Mr. Uh, uh, Clint, or whoever he spoke with, kind of misguided him on, on the elevator shaft. Um, also, uh, whenever we submit our elevations, uh, another thing I want to call into question about that 30-day, him having 30 days to file it, it was kind of their responsibility. You know, they have copies of our front elevation uh, down at the codes department. I feel it was the, the other party's responsibility to, to look, at, look at the plan and say, hey, this building's going up right in front of my house. It could potentially block the views of my house. That's public information that they can go pull up and say, hey, look, this bulkhead says 51 feet. This is going to block my view. They, the, I think that that might have been their, their <coughs> responsibility before yeah. they, but I mean, that's just uh, another thing that I'm, I'm looking at. I know that probably we got to take one step at a time here and, and, and get through the, the, the main issue, but uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, George Dean, again, back uh, for the appellant. Uh, let me, I guess, address the deferral uh, uh, first. At, ordinarily, I think that would be an excellent idea. Our, our concern is, of course, we're, both parties have uh, interest in carrying charges on the properties, and, and that is fairly substantial, I'm sure, for both groups. Uh, probably more importantly to us is um, uh, Mr. Johnson's property is up for sale now. Uh, if it gets sold, I'm not sure that we ever get a resolution because um, uh, I, I guess if we wound up in, in court, if, if Metro took them to court, I don't know, does the new property owner, uh, uh, the new property owner is not going to be very happy about um, uh, having to come into compliance. Uh, it sounds like a, a difficult enforcement kind of a problem. So that's our concern is a sale of the property uh, before we get back to the zoning board for, for a decision in this case. Um, I, I might also talk a little bit about uh, is there a use and occupancy on that property now do you know i, I have assumed that there is uh, is there a co issue do you know john Sorry, I okay i don't know uh, uh i'm not sure it is being listed for sale uh on the mls so um uh 
Uh, let me also say, with regard to the uh, these notice things on the 30 days, I don't know how much the board is on that, but uh, I got contacted originally in January of this year. First thing I did was talk to Bill, uh, told him we had a uh, as bill uh, showed that they were over the limit. Bill said, listen, when, what we're going to do is require the developer to submit an as-built. Uh, their as-built uh, came back in on February 27th, uh, showing that they complied. Ours, of course, showed that they didn't comply. Um, uh, as it happened, I was out of town and didn't get notice of any of that until the second week of March. Uh, I'm not sure that there was ever an official decision about any of that. Uh, I assumed, though, that since the uh, developers as built showed it complied, that the ruling would be against me, and we filed within 30 days of my knowledge of that, which we filed, I believe, on March 30th. So um, I did what I thought was appropriate under the circumstances, going to Bill. Uh, Bill asked me to go to, um, who's the, the chief of the building? Uh, Byron Hall. Uh, so I went and talked to Byron. Byron got uh, uh, the developer. The developer took some time to get his as built. Uh, no critical, no criticism about that, but it took him a while to get back. Uh, and again, I happened to be out of town at the time that the final uh, thing came in, uh, the final as built drawing came in, uh, and I didn't see it until the second week of March. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, hit the uh, uh, the most important, po oh, one other thing I'd say, I, I'm told that my clients also sent a certified letter to the company, uh, uh, Progressive Development, on February 1st of this year as well. Um, uh, I don't know whether Mr. Johnson saw it or what, but uh, a certified letter was sent as of that time. A um, uh, couple of other things, moving to the merits. Uh, I, there were, I don't know whether they've been distributed or not, but there were at least two property owners on either side of our property who submitted emails. Uh, in particular, one of them to the left of our property uh, made 25, had to make $25,000 worth of additional work on their property because of the construction. They didn't, they didn't understand, uh, as we didn't, uh, where the height of this might go. So they wound up, and, and there's an email that was sent to Debbie. Uh, uh, Debbie's not here today. Uh, uh, was sent to Debbie for the board uh, within the last two or three days, um, uh, specifying that that they, they spent approximately $25,000 having to make improvements uh, because of the height of the building that is, you know, not directly in front of them, but but uh, in front and to the side. Uh, there's another letter. Uh, the the folks on the right had similar kinds of problems and were concerned about buying actually on Archer Street uh, as, as a result of the, the height of this building. Uh, let me f f just say one final thing, and that is this. Bill has said something about kind of a, uh, a, um, a conflict between the two provisions. I don't think there is a conflict. I, I read them together. Uh, it says that there's a maximum height of 45 feet. Uh, it goes from natural grade to the roof deck. Uh, there's no permitted obstructions. Uh, uh, there are permitted obstructions in the commercial uh, for the bulkhead and the parapet. Uh, there's nothing for residential. And so uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the conflict there. It would have been easy to write the ordinance in a way that said that it applied that, that those permitted obstructions applied not only to commercial but also to single family residential. But for whatever reason, the council didn't choose to do that. Um, so from my standpoint, the two zoning regulations are um, uh, not in conflict. They Reading them together, they make perfect sense. It may not be, and I'm sympathetic to Mr. Johnson. I understand his problem. My clients have a similar problem. They were told by codes one thing. He was told something else. And by the way, uh, Pierre, uh, who I from, somehow I have never bumped into in 35 years, Talk to uh, my guys as well as uh, Clint and Pierre has been there, had been there for a, a long period of time. So, uh, whatever the communications problem was, I'm sympathetic and I understand. But the rule, when you read it, is reasonably clear. I think. Is there? Um, you you had, you expressed some reservations about uh, the deferral because of. Um, you know, if, if the property were sold, then it, it might create a whole different situation. I mean, is there, um, I, I think there's no doubt we're going to de defer this to give uh, the it, it, the staff time to, and and, 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 and frankly, Metro Legal to more time to take a look at something that we haven't seen mm -hmm. um, and, and to come back with, uh, 
you know, with, with some more information for us. Um, but is there a, a you know, I, I guess if we knew they, if, whether or not they had a certificate of occupancy, I mean, that's something that you certainly could say, well, uh, ask if we could put that on hold until, right. you know, but um, if, if those are issued, I don't know what, do you know of anything, protection that we could offer that would give you more comfort or, uh, or if, if, if you came back and, and, and they were sold and, and we ruled in your favor, then um, is that just a burden that the new homeowners would, would have uh, to deal with? Well, ultimately, I guess the new homeowners probably would look back at Mr. Johnson. I, I don't, it just makes it all a lot more difficult, it seems to me. That's, that's all. And I understand the board's idea that it would be helpful to have the deferral. Uh, I, I can see that. Uh, it just kind of puts my clients in kind of a little bit of a difficult position as far as if the property in front gets sold and whether the enforceability of it after that. Well, th well, those burdens would still be in place no matter which way we, we rule because there are potential appeals on both sides, so. That's certainly true. Mr. Dean, what is the, what is the basic distance or height? Uh, 45 feet is, the way I read it, 45 feet's the maximum. And I mean, and what is existing and what is challenged? Oh, uh, the, um, uh, the top of the bulkhead is basically 52 feet, and then the top of the parapet wall is basically just under 47 feet, and 45 is the maximum, as I read it. I, there, there was a question also, by the way, about um, you know d discretion of the zoning administrator. Really, it sounded, and, and Mr. Harper was asking the question, and really it sounded more like a variance application than uh, zoning administrator discretion. Uh, but in any event, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you the same same question. Yeah. Are there any any more questions for Mr. Dean? Okay. At this point, uh, any other questions for any? At this point, we'll close the public hearing. I, I agree with the comments that. Well, Cynthia. I just think for uh, the problem as I see it is we have an app, uh, not an applicant, but an owner who relied on the information he was given, and that information may be in conflict with the law, but it's not in conflict with the policy as it proceeded before now. So I'm very uh, hesitant to, to rule today until we make a, have a better determination what this looks like going forward. I know we have to rule on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but I think we would benefit from more, more information to do that. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is this is a very common building type now, and I think it's I think we um, will do our sales service and the city service to give uh, our experts more time to take it uh, to take a look at it. Um, do you all prefer uh, one meeting, two meetings? What would be? I'll let Mr. Michael weigh on that. I understand the 18th is going to be a very, very long meeting for us, but whatever the board says. Mr. Vice Chairman, all dockets are disastrously long from here until the foreseeable end of time. We submit to your better judgment. I, I would, however much time we take, I, I would like uh, our, our uh, counselor to, to look at uh, what we've been talking about, the Mr. Dean claims it's not not in conflict, but uh, Mr. Herbert is, I, I believe, sees the, the two parts of the code in, in conflict, and I'd like to hear Metro's legal's opinion on that. But it, whatever uh, counsel you can offer us the next time we meet, if you could do that for us, please. And that, do you? Let's see. We're at the beginning of the month, so our next meeting is only two weeks away. Would would that be enough time for? for I will have an answer for y'all whenever y'all decide to reset it on the docket. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, and, and I'm I'm comfortable, I mean, with the marathon, um, if, if that's the way it needs to be. But yeah, I, well, I, well, let's, I'll, I'll move, I move that we defer this to our, our next meeting and, and put it at the top of the agenda. Okay. I'll second that. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, everybody in favor, say aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? 
And then, and, and I would say that, um, you know, in terms of sale, whatever, that's, that's your business, but it, knowing that it's still up in the air I'd, and the conflicts that have been raised, I think I'd, you know, just be cautious about that, but we'll, we hear this in two weeks. So. That's our last case, Mr. Vice Chairman, it concludes the business of the board. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.